this morning. Come on, support me, do a good job. The subcommittee will come to order. Uh, before giving my opening statement, uh, for planning purposes, we've asked the secretary to confirm her appearance before the subcommittee in the first week of December. As you will remember, uh, the secretary assured the committee that she would work with us to find a date in early December to provide an update on implementation, and we look forward to hearing an update from Secretary Sebelius directly in a few weeks. Uh, also, I'd like to seek unanimous consent that Congressman Lee Terry uh, can sit with us and take part in today's hearing without objection, so ordered. The chair will now recognize himself for an opening statement. Since the disastrous rollout of healthcare.gov on October 1st, Americans have learned even more about the Affordable Care Act. They've learned that if you like your plan, there's a good chance you have or will lose it. Premiums and deductibles are going up, not down, as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Millions have already received cancellation notices for their current insurance policies, and many more will receive similar letters before the end of the year. The administration keeps telling these people that they will get better, more comprehensive care in an exchange plan. What they don't point out is that premiums in the individual market are going up approximately 40 percent nationwide. Numerous people have contacted my office to share that their premiums and deductibles have gone up, some even more than doubling. Americans have also learned that if you like your doctor, you may not be able to continue seeing him or her. In an effort to keep premiums down in the face of the law's countless mandates, Many exchange plans have narrowed the number of in-network providers, so your doctor or hospital may no longer participate in your insurance plan. Analyses have show that <clears throat> more than half of hospitals have still not signed any exchange contracts. Americans are now learning that when the healthcare.gov website does work, the personal information they enter may not be secure. A September 3rd internal CMS memo even said that, quote, the threat and risk potential to the system is limitless, end quote. It is clear that rather than give Americans the peace of mind that comes with good health care coverage, the law is making life worse for Americans across the country. And finally, of the people who were able to successfully use healthcare.gov, many of them ended up enrolling in Medicaid. The program already has serious access problems, as many providers refuse to take Medicaid patients. Studies show that the care Medicaid patients receive is often substandard. An influx of newly eligible patients will further strain the system. The Affordable Care Act's problems are not limited to a website. This law was sold to the American people with false promises, and real people are being hurt. Despite the clear evidence, Many supporters of the law still condescendingly assert that Americans are too uninformed to realize the benefits of the Affordable Care Act. Perhaps it is time for the supporters of the law to look at the front page of any newspaper and face reality. This law is hurting, not helping Americans. While it may have been convenient to tell Americans that they can keep their health care plan under the Affordable Care Act, it is time for my colleagues to put away that broken promise once and for all. Our constituents deserve better. Tomorrow the House will have a chance to partially remedy, remedy one of the false promises of the Affordable Care Act by voting on H.R. 3350, the Keep Your Health Plan Act of 2013. And I hope all of my colleagues will support this common sense bill. I'd like to welcome all of our witnesses here today. I look forward to their testimony and yield bounce my time to Dr. Burgess. I thank the chairman for yielding it three and a half years later. It's pretty obvious this thing was never ready for prime time, was not supposed to get signed into law, was signed actually by an accident because of the failure of the Democratic House and Senate at that time to come together in a conference committee and work out the problems. We are now left with the debris of this failed promise. 
My understanding is the president's going to talk to the country in a little over an hour's time. Perhaps he'll have some new light to shed on things. In the meantime, it is the work of our subcommittee to continue to try to get answers to the American people and to pri provide them with the relief that they have been so anxiously uh, uh, petitioning our offices in the last several weeks. Um, we're all worried about the technical problems. I don't doubt at some point technical problems will get solved. I've got grave doubts about the glitch czar who's been appointed, but nevertheless, at some point, the technical problems get solved. And then you start the access problems. They start January 1st. You're going to have people showing up in doctor's offices and hospitals all over the country in July. They'll produce a little card saying they're covered by uh, an insurance company. Uh, they will perhaps have made a, their first payment. But when the bill is submitted, the insurance company may well say, I've never heard of this person because the electronic information was not transferred. Would it surprise anyone that that, in fact, could occur, given the experience that we've all had for the last six weeks with healthcare.gov? Uh, the strain that this will put on the provider community is enormous. The failure of Health and Human Services and the White House to heed the internal warnings about their lack of readiness for the website demonstrates that the Obama administration has failed in overall project management and leadership. The fact is this subcommittee, on this subcommittee, I've asked the questions that the President says he should have asked before this thing came out. Uh, again, it is the job of our subcommittee to provide answers to those questions, and fortunately tomorrow on the floor of the House we'll be able to offer a solution as well. I yield back to the Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the Ranking Member, Mr. Plone, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As usual, um, I hear all these statements from the other side of the aisle, which are just incredibly wrong and inaccurate and unfair. Uh, let me start out by saying uh, Obamacare and I won't call it that, the Affordable Care Act is not an accident. It was purposely signed into law because Democrats, unfortunately not Republicans, believe that they could make a difference in improving the health care system uh, for Americans. And the fact of the matter is it's not hurting. It is helping. Uh, for the sake of the record, I reiterate that the law will, is allowing millions of uninsured and underinsured Americans to gain access to comprehensive health care coverage. It applies critical consumer protections to new and existing health plans under the law so that no longer can insurers deny someone coverage just because they have cancer, for example. And, and the fact of the matter is, uh, with its passage, we are ensuring that health care is a right, not a privilege, and that almost every American, uh, other than, I, I guess, the undocumented, will have health insurance. Um, the thing that really bothers me is that I never hear anything from the other side of the aisle talking about how, what the alternative is. I don't hear anything about what they're going to put in place to make people insured who are under, who are insured, or people who are underinsured to have better benefits. Um, the the statement by the chairman about the Medicaid uh, situation is incredible to me, and I and I respect you a lot, Mr. Chairman. But look. The reason why Medicaid is not being expanded in a lot of states is because Republican governors have refused to expand it. But they're not coming up with an alternative. They're not saying, okay, now you can't get Medicaid and therefore you can get something else. They have no alternative, even, they, even though they would get 100 percent funding to, uh, to expand it. And the same thing. Uh, I hear the chairman say, well, you know, as you're going to have Medicaid coverage, which is a good thing because you have no coverage right now. Uh, but, you know, you may not be able to find the doctor or, you know, the doctor may not take the reimbursement rate. Well, then, then the, the purpose of this committee is to fix that, fix the Medicaid problem, provide more funding, you know, fix the reimbursement rate. Now, I know we've made some progress with that on the Medicare front with Dr. Burgess, and I certainly don't want to take away from that with the SGR, but what about Medicaid? So, I, you know, I, I don't believe that there's any interest on this part of the Republicans to fix any of the problems that are occurring with the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. They simply want to demonize the president and his policies. They'll go to any length to do so. And at the top of the list are these efforts to sabotage Obamacare and force its failure. And the best example of that is what they're proposing tomorrow with the chairman of our committee, uh, Mr. Upton. I called a previous um, hearing of the committee a monkey court. I'll call this the monkey wrench. The umpted bill is the monkey wrench that they're trying to throw in to basically destroy Obamacare because what it essentially does, it says that insurance companies that have these lousy policies, uh, skeletal policies, 
uh, they, they can continue to sell them. Actually, they can continue to sell them now, but they want to expand that opportunity and allow them to sell policies that are skeletal, that are cat only cal cal catastrophic, that don't cover hospital care, for example. And they're not, e in the Upton bill, the monkey wrench, they're even proposing that not only the people that have those policies, but new people can buy those policies. And so what does that do? It means that the healthier people, it means that the younger people can buy these, you know, skeletal catastrophic policies that they may not even be aware uh, of what's covered. Um, and then the insurance pool is broken and prices go up for everyone else. Uh, and the problem right now, unfortunately, is that we have this website that doesn't work and a lot of people, when their policies are canceled by the insurance companies, not by the Affordable Care Act, um, don't realize that they have a place to go where they can find a better policy for an affordable price because the website is not working. So again, we have to fix the website. I appreciate the fact that Dr. Burgess said that uh, it will be fixed. He's got the confidence that it will be fixed. Um, but again, um, the problem here is that, again, you know, this committee, uh, this subcommittee is really not having an oversight or implementation hearing. Uh, they, I think it's quite clear from what's already been said by my Republican colleagues that they just think Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act uh, should be repealed. And, you know, we, we cannot go down that road because it is providing help uh, for, for so many Americans. And the Republicans have no alternative. They never have. And that's my biggest criticism of all of you on the other side. I'd never hear the alternative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, five minutes for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, since uh, 2009, this committee and the Congress has vigorously debated the consequences of the president's health care law and what it would mean for patients and families across the country. These past 45 days have provided a disturbing glimpse of what reality looks like under the president's health care bill. Millions of Americans are losing their private, affordable coverage. Premiums are skyrocketing. Medicaid is enduring an untenable expansion, diverting it from its core mission, and a website continues to frustrate Americans online and will continue to do so probably long after the November 30th date that the Secretary told us just two weeks ago would work. The results correctly described in recent news reports have been nothing short of disastrous. Enrollment figures finally released just yesterday underscore some of the law's most significant issues as well as fundamental broken promises. Fifty times as many folks are receiving cancellation notices than are even selecting a plan on healthcare.gov. And nearly 80% of these first figures are Medicaid dependents, an omnibus forecast of what's in store for the program originally designed to assist those Americans most in need of a helping hand, in other words, the most vulnerable. And for those with health plans, premiums are skyrocketing across the country. In my state, Michigan, residents face an estimated almost 70% average increase in the individual market under the president's health care law. That isn't health care reform. That's not what American, the American people were promised. While, bro while the broken website continues to define the first weeks and months of open enrollment, the law itself has been constructed on a series of broken promises. Regardless of whether or when the computer glitches are fixed, the law's problems run even deeper. The broken promises of if you like your plan, you can keep it, period, and the, premium, and the premiums would go down an average of $2,500 are causing unneeded worry, anxiety, and hardship for households across the country. Cancellations today, sticker shock tomorrow. Sadly, the news probably is only going to get worse. Cancellations stem far beyond the 5% of Americans that the president claims are affected by his broken promise. Many workers with employer-sponsored insurance have learned or will soon learn that the president's health care law is going to take away their coverage as well. So beyond these broken promises, the law's Medicaid expansion threatens our commitment to the nation's most vulnerable, potentially adding 26 million Americans to its roster, further straining the important safety net program. So the first days of the health care law have caused many Americans to lose faith in their government, revealing the ugly truth of what Washington-driven big government health care can look like. Yield the balance of my time to Mr. Terry. Thank you, uh, Chairman Upton, and I appreciate you yielding. 
And this is an issue of trust. And uh, basically, if we can't trust the administration to create a run a website, how can we trust them with the big issues of running our health care? We've heard you, you can have your uh, insurance, keep your insurance if you want it. We've heard that this will be the most open and transparent administration, but those have been violated. Just a week or two ago, uh, when Secretary Sebelius uh, responded to my question about information about who was entering or how many had entered, we were told uh, she could not give us that number because the numbers were unreliable. Well, they had the numbers. It was just that they didn't have or, or their story straight. Now, she did release the numbers yesterday. We learned that 338 Nebraskans signed up. We real, uh, learned that there were a total of 106,000 that signed up, most of them for Medicare expansion. We were being told it was 700,000, including a press conference or a press call right after the hearing last week. So my bill restores that trust. We have an insurance commissioners in every state to which the administration has not communicated with. So this bill is simple. It uh, provides information to the decision makers, the insurance commissioners and governor's office of each state. It requires a state by state breakdown of that data. This is not a partisan bill. It will keep insurance commissioners at the state level and the American people uh, involved in this act. Uh, and they will be able to sort through the details and that will help regain the trust and I yield back chair thanks gentlemen now recognize the ranking member of the full committee mr. Waxman five minutes for an opening statement thank you very much mr. chairman the Affordable Care Act has uh, always aroused strong passions among opponents and defenders of the law and as a supporter of the law I see it as part of one, one of my core missions in public life to help every American get access to quality health care, regardless of his or her income or background. It's about fairness, justice, and compassion. The Republican obsession with thwarting the law has always puzzled me, because the law is premised on three fundamentally conservative notions, lowering health care costs, individual responsibility to have coverage, and the private health insurance market. Making sure that every American has health coverage was once a favorite policy of the Conservative Heritage Foundation. It was meant to ensure that people take responsibility for their own health costs rather than forcing them on to everybody else. Because of the Affordable Care Act, millions of Americans who would have gone uninsured will have coverage. Just yesterday, we learned that 1.5 million people have already applied for coverage, a faster pace than Massachusetts when they enacted a very similar law. Even with all the technical problems we've had, people are getting access to insurance. In my state, nearly 400,000 people have begun applications in just the first month. There, these are significant signs of progress. They show we're on our way to dramatically expanding health insurance coverage in this nation. The law is also slow, slowing the growth in health care costs, all health care costs. Due to the law's sensible reforms, hospital readmissions are down 10 percent in the Medicare program since 2011. Hundreds of providers are now joining affordable care organizations putting us on a path to pay for the quality of health care, not just the quantity of care. And we have seen health, co health costs grow at their slowest rate in 50 years. Reform is working. However, it, it is obvious to all that there are great challenges uh, it, uh, when a program like this gets going. Too many Americans have gotten worrisome letters from their insurers. These letters can give the misleading impression that people will be left without any insurance coverage starting January 1. 
and the federal web website is not working well, so many people don't yet know what options they have. But here are the facts. Americans who have insurance through their employers or Medicare or Medicaid will keep their current coverage, and those who buy new plans on the exchange will often get better plans at a lower cost. The 240 million people with employer coverage or coverage through a public program will not see significant changes next year because of the ACA. Within the much smaller individual insurance market, nearly 5 million people will be eligible for a tax credit worth an average of $5,000, which will lower their out-of-pocket costs. Over a million more people will be eligible for Medicaid, which means additional savings. Millions more will finally get a good deal on quality coverage. No one can be denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition. No one can see higher rates because they have been sick. No one can see their rates go up if they do get sick. No one will run up against an annual cover coverage limit or realize too late that their plan doesn't cover key benefits. That's the status quo the Republicans want to continue, these insurance abuses. Tomorrow, the House will vote on a bill that would jeopardize all of these reforms. It would send us back to a world where insurers can offer plans that provide no real protections or exclude people based on pre-existing conditions. Under the Republican bill, insurers could cherry pick the best risks and destabilize the insurance market for everyone else. I know that a transition to a more fair and stable marketplace may not always be easy, but we cannot go back to the discriminatory, inefficient market we've had before. I look forward to hearing from Professor Corlett and Reverend Dixon Hill about the progress we have made and why we cannot turn back now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to gentlemen. On our panel today, we have uh, five witnesses, and I'll introduce them at this time. First, the Honorable Mike Astrew, former Commissioner, Social Security Administration. Mr. Ovik Roy, Senior Fellow, Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. Ms. Sabrina Corlett, Research Professor, Health Policy Institute, Georgetown University. Reverend Marilyn Dixon Hill, registered nurse and clergy person, Camden Bible Tabernacle. And I would like to yield 30 seconds to Congresswoman McMorris Rogers to introduce our last witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my great pleasure to introduce one of our witnesses today, Dr. Roger Stark. He's a surgeon from my home state, Washington and has been uh, seeing firsthand the impact of the implementation of Obamacare as it's crowding out private insurance both in Washington State and across our country. He's a corn husker, husker uh, graduating from the University of Nebraska College of Medicine, completed postgraduate training at the University of Utah, Virginia Mason Medical Center, and the University of Washington. He's a member of Alpha Omega Alpha, a National Medical Honorary Society, and in addition, he's devoted many years to the study of health care policy and currently serves as the health care policy analyst at the Washington Policy Center, which is an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan health care think tank located in Washington State. So I thank Dr. Stark for being here today. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. Thank you all for coming. You will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. Your written testimony will be entered into the record. And at this point, I would like to recognize the Honorable Astrew for his opening statement. Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I'm a former HHS General Counsel and Commissioner of Social Security. In the latter capacity, I also served as a trustee of the Social Security and Medicare Trust Funds. As Commissioner, I oversaw the replacement and expansion of most parts of Social Security's highly rated suite of electronic services. That work included complex projects, including electronic services for filing for retirement, disability, and Medicare. To reduce the hearings backlog, we built a fully electronic system 
so representatives could access status reports directly and conduct video hearings from their own offices. We introduced novel services such as online filing in Spanish and a NIST Level 3 service for supplying online earnings statements. The agency is now rolling out a massive state-of-the-art IT system for the 54 state and territorial disability determination agencies. During my watch, we worked with HHS on several new programs under the Affordable Care Act, most notably the health care exchanges. I have seen attempts to blame its so-called glitches on silly explanations ranging from enthusiasm for the exchanges to the policies of Ronald Reagan. The simple truth is that HHS mismanaged the process. Failure was not inevitable. It was achieved. Former Administrator Berwick failed to put in place the basic assignments, goals, and systems of accountability necessary to manage a project of this scope. There was no full-time senior project manager. There were no biweekly or monthly team meetings with Berwick. And there were no specifications for most, part of, most major parts of the system at the point where he left office. HHS made little progress on Berwick's watch. By the time Marilyn Tavener became acting administrator, it was common knowledge inside the, in, inside the executor branch that HHS was compromising quality in order to meet last month's deadline. Decisions started to be made, but were made in a disjointed and siloed fashion. Senior executives began to express confidence that support for the Affordable Care Act was so strong that they would be able to fix the problems of the exchanges after the launch. Lack of transparency during this time period helped to doom the system. The small doses of accountability that come from demonstrating your work to experts, experts, colleagues in other agencies and advocacy groups did not occur with this project. It's also important to understand that our statutory watchdog HHS Inspector General Daniel Levinson undermined transparency during this critical period. His auditors, who should have been alerting Congress and the public about the chaos at HHS, did nothing. His sole contribution was a four and a half page analysis on August 2nd of this year that can be summarized as HHS tells us that everything will be fine. Since that time, the congressional testimony of Levinson's representatives has been smug and unhelpful. I challenge you to read the list of Inspector General audits reports for this year and to identify just one report that you wouldn't trade for a thorough audit of the functionality and security of the exchanges. In short, good government requires a new Inspector General. If the Inspector General had done his job properly, President Obama and his advisors would know that asking Jeffrey Zients, an able public servant, to fix the exchanges in just one month is a recipe for failure. While I believe functionality may approve in the coming months, this frantic effort to make thousands of adjustments does not leave Mr. Zients with enough time to make or test changes, which cannot be done in isolation, but which must be tested as a whole. Anyone with experience in building these kinds of systems knows that even minor changes in one part of a system can cause major unexpected problems in seemingly unrelated parts of the system. The so-called IT surge is a mistake that will compound past mistakes. The work should not drive the schedule. The schedule should drive the work. These past mistakes are even dragging down state exchanges that were working before October 1. In Massachusetts, where I live, we operated a seamless exchange before the passage of the Affordable Care Act. However, now according to the Boston Herald, once it was linked to the federal hub, it became, began requiring that some applicants identify themselves as inmates or mental patients. People with hyphenated names, disproportionately women, are being denied service. Only 549 of the 150,000 people being denied insurance coverage due to the Affordable Care Act have registered for a policy, and none of these people in Massachusetts have insurance yet. A true fix is impossible in one month because the shortcuts taken to meet the October 1 deadline abandon the usual cybersecurity defenses. Extensive unencrypted data flowing from the so-called cloud through the exchanges makes it a hacker's dream. CNN and others have hired hackers who have easily penetrated the system and obtained sensitive personal information, including answers to security questions commonly used by banks, brokerages, and medical institutions. I believe painful breaches of the HHS systems are just a matter of time and that a true fix cannot happen quickly or cheaply. Primarily for that reason, Americans will increasingly hesitate to use the exchanges. 
we should stop demanding shortcuts. Instead, we should insist on greater transparency, greater candor, greater respect for the privacy of Americans, and greater technical competence. Thank you. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. And now recognize Mr. Roy, five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Pitts, <clears throat> Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the Health Subcommittee, thanks for inviting me to speak with you today about the Affordable Care Act. My name is Ovik Roy, and I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, in which capacity I conduct research on health care and entitlement reform. I'm an advocate of market-based universal coverage. I believe that the wealthiest country in the world can and should strive to protect every American from financial ruin due to injury or illness. Furthermore, I believe that well-designed, subsidized insurance marketplaces are among the most attractive vehicles for achieving these goals. It is for these reasons that I am deeply concerned about the way in which the ACA's insurance exchanges have been designed and implemented. Most of all, I'm concerned that the law will drive up the cost of health insurance, especially for people who shop for coverage on their own. As you know, the ACA makes substantial changes to the individual health insurance market. The law broadly bars insurers from charging different rates to the sick and to the healthy and requires insurers to raise rates on younger individuals in order to partially subsidize coverage for the old. It mandates that insurers cover a broad range of services that individuals might not otherwise choose to purchase. The law taxes premiums, pharmaceuticals, and medical devices in a manner that has the net effect of increasing the cost of insurance. Earlier this month, I and two colleagues at the Manhattan Institute completed the most comprehensive study to date of individual market premiums in 2014 relative to 2013. We examined the five least expensive plans in the, available in the individual market for every county in the United States, averaged their premiums, and adjusted the result to take into account those who, due to pre-existing conditions, could not purchase insurance at those rates. We examined premiums for 27, 40, and 64-year-old men and women. We then compared those rates to the comparable ones on the ACA exchanges. Our analysis found that the average state will see a 41% increase in underlying premiums prior to the impact of subsidies. Among the states seeing large increases are North Carolina at 136%, Georgia at 92%, Michigan 66%, Louisiana 53%, and Kentucky at 47% and Illinois at 43%. Our analysis did find that eight states will see average premiums decrease under the law, including New York at a decline of 40% and New Jersey decline of 19%. Of the six categories we studied, 27-year-old men face the steepest increases with an average hike of 77%. 40-year-old women see the mildest increases with an average of 18%. We also study the impact of the law's premium assistance payments on exchange premiums. Our analysis found that for individuals of average income, taxpayer-funded insurance subsidies primarily flow to those nearing retirement. This is because the elderly will still pay more for insurance on average than younger individuals and because the subsidies are designed to fix the percentage of one's income devoted to paying for health insurance premiums. Taking subsidies into account, 64-year-old men will pay on average 19% less for insurance under the ACA system, whereas 27-year-old men will pay 41% more. The Manhattan Institute analysis indicates that we are indeed likely to see a fair amount of adverse selection on the exchanges. People who consume an above average amount of health care services, such as sicker and older individuals, have a compelling economic incentive to enroll on the ACA marketplaces. Healthier and younger individuals have less of an incentive, even when one takes the individual mandate into account. While many in the press are focused on the exchange enrollment figures that HHS released yesterday, what's more important than the number of people who enroll in the exchanges is the composition of the people who enroll in the exchanges. This will give us a sense of whether or not marketplace premiums are likely to further increase in 2015 and 2016, exacerbating the problem of adverse selection. Our analysis did not directly examine the degree to which exchange-based plans have higher deductibles and narrower provider networks relative to plans available in 2013. There have been, however, many anecdotal reports of people paying higher premiums for plans with higher deductibles and narrower physician networks than the plans they previously enjoyed. It is not inherently a bad thing for individuals to choose plans with higher deductibles and narrow networks, especially if those choices allow Americans to reduce their monthly premiums. However, in the case of the ACA, 
Many individuals are reporting higher premiums for less attractive health coverage. It would be one thing if the ACA was forcing Americans off their old health insurance policies and offering them more attractive plans at a lower price. But millions of Americans are likely to see less attractive coverage at a higher price. If they do, then the Affordable Care Act will not live up to its name, and its goal of near-universal coverage will remain unfulfilled. I look forward to your questions and of, to being of further assistance to this committee. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognizes Mir Ms. Corlett, five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, and thank you. My name is Sabrina Corlett, and I'm a senior research fellow at Georgetown University's Center on Health Insurance Reforms. In my testimony today, I will focus on two issues, how the individual health insurance market works today for consumers and the recent spate of so-called policy cancellations. The ACA focuses its reforms on the individual market because of its well-documented systemic problems, which include a lack of access to coverage, unaffordable coverage, and inadequate coverage. Today, 48 million Americans are uninsured, and 11 million have individual coverage. Those who buy insurance on their own can be self-employed entrepreneurs, farmers and ranchers, early retirees, and young people aging off their parents' plans. What does this health insurance market look like for these folks, particularly those who are in less than perfect health? Prior to the ACA, insurers managed costs through aggressive underwriting to deny coverage to people with pre-existing conditions. People with even minor health issues, such as hay fever, could be turned down. And many individuals, even if they're offered a policy, are charged more because of their health status, gender, or age. Even those who enter the market in perfect health can find that premiums become unaffordable over time. As for the adequacy of individual market coverage, it's generally abysmal. In many states, insurers are permitted to permanently exclude from coverage any health problems that a consumer discloses. And many policies exclude, as a matter of course, critical benefits such as maternity, mental health, and prescription drugs. Individual policies also come with high deductibles. $10,000 or more is not uncommon. Individual policyholders report far more problems paying both premiums and out-of-pocket costs compared to people covered under group plans today. There has been a lot of attention lately on people with individual health insurance receiving policy cancellations from their insurance companies. First, Having an insurance company cancel a policy is nothing new. Insurance companies have long been able to discontinue individual insurance policies when it is no longer in their business interest to maintain them. They've also long been able to hike premiums and modify coverage. Second, the ACA doesn't require insurers to drop policies. Rather, it requires individuals to have insurance that meets basic minimum standards. Individuals who first purchased their policy after March 23, 2010, will be required to transition to new coverage that meets these standards. Anticipating the need for their policyholders to make this transition, insurers have taken different approaches. Some have offered an opportunity to early renew so that policyholders can remain in their current coverage for up to one more year. Some have notified policyholders they will need to transition to new coverage. And some have decided to discontinue some of their current policies at the end of this year and notified policyholders so they can take advantage of open enrollment on the exchanges. Had the exchange websites been operable on October 1st, the reaction to insurer notices likely would have been much less dramatic than it has been. Consumers who receive these notices have been justifiably alarmed, particularly when the insurer notice does not lay out all of their new coverage options or provide estimates of the subsidies for which millions will be eligible. Hopefully soon, all the websites will be working so that consumers can see these new coverage options that will likely be a better value than anything they've been able to get on the individual market. Unfortunately, some policy proposals, such as the bill introduced by Chairman Upton, would actually make the problem worse. First, Mr. Upton's bill doesn't actually address the problem it purports to solve. Nothing in it prohibits insurers from discontinuing policies they don't want to maintain. Second, by segmenting the risk pool between the healthy and the less healthy, the bill will set up an insurance death spiral, resulting in higher premiums and less choice for millions of Americans. Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, the current health insurance market does not work for the people who need it the most. What we have had is a system of haves 
and have-nots. And even if you have insurance, you still cannot have peace of mind because today's insurance market may offer low teaser rates to some, but it can't sustain affordability of coverage over time as people inevitably age or get sick. Instead, this market is likely to fail people just when they need their coverage to mo their, the most. Congress recognized the fundamental injustice of the current system, and it enacted important reforms that over time will improve Americans' access to adequate and more affordable coverage. I look forward to your questions. Chair, thanks. Gentlelady now recognizes Reverend Dixon Hill. Five minutes for opening statement. You want to turn on the mic, please, or pull it closer? Can you hear me? That's good. Good morning, uh, uh, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the Health Subcommittee. Thank you. My name is Reverend Marilyn Dixon Hill. I'm a registered nurse for almost 30 years and currently serve as an associate pastor at Camden Bible Tabernacle Church in Camden, New Jersey. Camden has been my home for 40 years, and I'm very active in the community especially as a, churchy, a clergy leader with Camden Churches Organized for People, CCOP, and affiliate of PICO National Network with more than 1,000 member institutions representing 1 million families in 17 states. And a fastest, PICO is the fastest and growing network of faith-based community organizations in the country. Today, I'm here to share my story with you as a representative of PICO and the hundreds of thousands of people of faith who belong to our network. The value of people being able to access care is very real to me. That day, November 10th, 2010, will be a day I will remember forever. On that day, almost exactly three years ago, I received what should have been a routine flu shot. But that shot ended up being anything but routine. Due to a very rare side effect, I became completely paralyzed and nearly died. Although I have recovered somewhat, I'm disabled and live with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Although there are many lessons I learned from this challenging time in my life, the one that brings me here today was my firsthand experience with how broken our health care system was. When I was released from rehabilitation, that is, finally able to sit up and even stand for short periods of time, I discovered that I could not financially afford to continue my care. Paying for COBRA was too expensive, and my disability benefit was too high to qualify for Medicaid. In short, the very health insurance that would have made it possible for me to continue to rehabilitate and eventually enter back into the workforce was unavailable to me. I spent two years in this painful gap before finally qualifying for coverage through Medicare. Sadly, many going through health coverage challenges like this never make it to getting the care that they need. And that was the case for one of our congre uh, congregation members, Ronald Butler, 56-year-old uninsured man who died from a, a brain tumor. Despite two trips to a hospital, Ronald's, Ronald's tumor went undetected until a week before he died, all because he didn't have health insurance. Truly, it's tragic for both Ronald and me to have such serious problems, but the real tragedy is it didn't have to be as painful, as terrifying, and isolating as it was. Our lives could have been improved, sustained, and in Ronald's case, even saved if he, if he had received the care that he needed and ought to have had. My experience is echoed in the experiences of so many in Camden and throughout the United States. That's what motivated me to get involved in reforming our health care system. And my firm belief that we're all called to love one another and to care for one another inspires me every day to ensure that everyone has access to the affordable care that they need. Now with the Health Care Act being fully implemented, my community and communities like mine across America are mobilizing to bring affordable care to the people who need it most. We're bringing enrollment opportunities to our congregations, to food pantries, schools, and our neighborhood because we know there's a hunger and a deep need for health insurance. Accessing affordable care strengthens our communities. It helps us thrive, and it's good, sound economics for our countries. The ACA uh, implementation, Medicaid enrollment is up. Yes, we expected that. It shows that the bill got it right and is working to get people living without health insurance the coverage that they need. 
October the 24th in Camden alone, the Camden County Board of Social Services received 609 direct applications, at least 134 of which would not have been eligible for Medicaid. Secondly, we know from our lived experiences and substantial research that a healthier society is a more productive society. Look no further than my own story. My lack of access to affordable care prevented my full rehabilitation and return to working as a nurse. Mr. Chair, Ranking Member Pallone and members of the Health Subcommittee, access to affordable health care saves lives, supports communities and families, and helps communities thrive, for we are all our brother's keeper. Thank you for your time today and this opportunity to speak with you. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Now recognize Dr. Stark, five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, uh, Chairman Pitts, uh, Ranking Member Pallone. Pull the mic towards you a little bit, maybe. Good morning, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity this morning to testify before your subcommittee. Washington State has been very proactive about establishing a state health insurance exchange and about expanding our Medicaid program as allowed by the Affordable Care Act. Our state exchange opened for enrollment on October 1st. We anticipate that ultimately we will see 320,000 to 400,000 enrollees in the new expanded Medicaid program. As of October 31st, our exchange had a total of 105,000 applicants with 70,000 of these in the new Medicaid program. This represents 67% of the total. Of these applicants, 55,000 completed the enrollment process with 48,000 of these completions in the new Medicaid. This represents 87% of the total. In other words, almost 90% of completed applications were done in the new Medicaid program where no upfront premium fee is required. Although the ACA is written such that state taxpayers will eventually pay only 10% of the cost of the new Medicaid, it should be noted that state taxpayers are also federal taxpayers. Medicaid is a pay-as-you-go entitlement. Therefore, Washington state taxpayers will ultimately pay for essentially the entire cost of the new Medicaid in our state, which is estimated to be 17 to $22 billion dollars depending on enrollment over 10 years. The ultimate consequence of this broad expansion of government into health care has been to crowd out private insurance. Over 20% of adults and 27% of children in the existing Medicaid already had private insurance at the time they enrolled. As Medicaid has expanded, it is now estimated that up to one half of current new enrollees already have private coverage. As employers, especially in low-wage industries, drop employee health benefits, this crowd-out effect will only get worse in the expanded Medicaid. There is also the phenomenon of the welcome mat or woodwork effect, and this is real. Because of increasing advertisement, increasing public relations, patients who qualify for the existing Medicaid program will potentially enroll in large numbers. The Urban Institute looked at this on a state-by-state -state basis, and for Washington State, they estimate that 545,000 new enrollees will occur in our existing Medicaid program. This will be at a cost of $14 billion to the state of Washington taxpayers over 10 years. In 2008, Oregon officials created the perfect test case on the effectiveness of Medicaid in providing health care. This has been a controlled, randomized study of people with and without Medicaid. The New England Journal of Medicine recently re reported the results. It turns out that being put on Medicaid does not improve health outcomes, nor does it improve mortality statistics compared to having no health insurance coverage at all. Medicaid is an extremely inefficient program, and reimbursement for doctors and other providers is about one half of what private insurance pays for the same services. Doctors are not able to pay their own overhead with these low payment rates, and consequently our existing Medicaid patients have trouble accessing health care. The Washington State Medical Association recently found that 18 percent of primary care providers had dropped all Medicaid patients and 24 percent were not taking new Medicaid patients because of poor provider reimbursement. 
getting access to health care is a significant problem for people in the existing Medicaid program in our state. Like any entitlement program, Medicaid encourages overutilization. The tragic irony is that because of low provider reimbursements, access for patients is severely limited. All Medicaid patients, by definition, have health insurance, but just having health insurance does not guarantee one will receive health care services. Another tragedy is that after more than 40 years, there is no evidence Medicaid has improved health outcomes for the vast majority of either children or adults enrolled in the program. In conclusion, limited public safety net programs will always be needed to provide health care for the poorest and most vulnerable people in our society. However, the bloated and expanding Medicaid entitlement program, as it is presently structured, is not sustainable. Even though the new program will be funded by federal taxpayers, costs will explode, just as we have seen since 1965. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the opening statements. We'll now go to questions and answers, and I will recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Mr. Roy, President Obama recently apologized to Americans in the individual market losing their current health coverage because of the Affordable Care Act. During his statement, the President asserted that his broken promise would affect only a small portion of individuals, specifically stating that, quote, we're talking about 5 percent of the population, end quote. Do you believe the President is being truthful when he states only 5 percent of the population will be affected by his broken, if you like your health plan, you can keep it promised? Uh, no, I don't believe that uh, the President was making an accurate statement because people in the employer-sponsored market in particular will also see rate increases because of, uh, of the, the ACA's that, mandate. That was my follow-up question. Did the Affordable Care Act grandfathering regulation issued in the summer of 2010 contain any estimates for the number of Americans with employer-sponsored coverage that would lose grandfathered status? In June of 2010, the executive branch estimated that 51 percent of employer-sponsored plans would lose grandfathering coverage. If you add that to the total of people who are also losing grandfathering coverage in the individual market, the total is 93 million Americans. Recently, I received an email from a constituent in Lancaster County, Nancy Sullivan, who is trying to help a small business with four employees find affordable health coverage. Their small business received a cancellation notice stating that, quote, Enclosed, you will find the January 1, 2014 renewal information for your group coverage. Please note that due to requirements of the Affordable Care Act, your current benefit plan will no longer be available. She went on to say, in the news reports about the plans being eliminated, they're only mentioning the individual plans. This is not true. Group plans are also being eliminated due to requirements of the Affordable Care Act, end quote. Would it be fair to say that the President's promise of if you like your health care plan, you can keep your health plan, won't be true for the tens of millions of Americans with employer-sponsored insurance like the workers in Lancaster County that I just mentioned? I believe that would be a fair statement, yes. Dr. Stark, looking ahead, states will have to weigh any decision to expand their Medicaid programs against the existing financial pressure to meet other state priorities, such as education, economic development, public safety. In addition, they must balance the pressure to better serve their existing Medicaid enrollees before overexpanding. Governors and legislatures must recognize that every Medicaid dollar spent on an able-bodied childless adult in the expansion population is potentially a future dollar diverted from the poorest and sickest children and seniors enrolled currently. My home state of Pennsylvania is grappling with these questions now as they negotiate with CMS for greater flexibility to manage their program costs before an expansion. What advice would you give the states who have waited to expand but will certainly be forced with this question again in their 2015 budget negotiations? Well, I think each state has to look at their own individual situation, but clearly uh, uh, expanding Medicaid on a state-by-state -state basis is still going to put a burden on the federal government. I think what, what states need to do is look at how they budget for their individual Medicaid program and then allocate those dollars as wisely as they possibly can. 
uh, um, what we have seen over the last 45 years, 47 years in the Medicaid program is it's, it's grown dramatically such that it's now one of the top three budget items for every state in the country. Uh, in the state of Washington, it's number two behind K-12 through education. So this clearly is, is a very impacting uh, sort of impactful um, issue. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Astru. Uh, in your role as Commissioner of Social Security Administration, you oversaw the replacement and expansion of the Social Security Administration's highly rate uh, suite of electronic services, which included electronic services for retirement, disability, and, and Medicare. Can you give us an overview of these projects, explain the process and the collaboration which occurred? How did the process and collaboration of the Affordable Care Act differ from your past projects? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's a good question. I think for a project as important as this one, responsibility starts at the top. Um, that did not happen at CMS. And although it's not glamorous and you don't get credit in the Washington Post for it, the leader of the agency has to sit down with a strongly empowered team leader on a regular basis and go over what's the progress, what's the goal, what's the time frame, and slog through it every two weeks, every four weeks, until it's done. And that's what I did at Social Security. And we did a dozen of these major projects um, on my watch. And that way, you have flow of information, you have the other team members there, you create an environment where people volunteer what the problems are and you support the people um, who raise the problems, you deal with the problems early. And, and that's how you have success down the road. Unfortunately, the CMS plan is kind of like an NFL team showed up and they said, well, you're all professionals, you all want to win the game, here's your playbook, let's show up before, you know, three days before the first game. And you can't win that way. And at CMS and HHS proper, what didn't happen were those basic management techniques um, to get this kind of project done. And I think it's unfair to blame the contractors, blame the procurement process. Are there problems there? Yes. Did I sometimes have frustrations with some of those things? Yes. But are they a major part of the problem? No. The buck stops with the people who run the agency, and the political appointees do a disservice to the civil servants when they put all the blame on the civil servants, which isn't fair as well. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. Now I recognize the ranking member five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that the Republicans are showing their true colors today and basically attacking Medicaid. Uh, but I think this whole thing is very ideologically driven. They, they don't like Medicaid. They don't want to expand Medicaid. I don't, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but some of them might even want to abolish Medicaid. And, um, you know, Reverend Hill, I just wanted to thank you for your testimony about your struggles with the health care system and your efforts to help others get coverage. But one thing that's so frustrating about much of our discussion in this subcommittee is that we can't seem to agree on basic facts. For example, we don't seem to agree on whether people signing up for coverage is a good thing or a bad thing. Now, in the first month of enrollment, almost 1.5 million people have applied for coverage, and of those, 27 percent, or about 400,000 people, have been determined eligible for Medicaid or SCHIP. And this Medicaid enrollment is a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, this is despite the fact that half the states haven't implemented Medicaid expansion because the intransigence of Republican governors, again, ideologically based, not practically based. Uh, I do have to say, though, that usually I'm critical of Governor Christie, uh, but I do appreciate the fact that he expanded Medicaid in New Jersey, which is what makes it possible for you to talk about it in, in a positive way, because we do have it in New Jersey. But if individuals were eligible for Medicaid all along, it's a good thing that they finally enrolled. If they're newly eligible, that's a good thing, too. I don't think we should be disagreeing about people accessing benefits for which they're legally eligible. Uh, despite Dr. Uh, Stark's testimony, key studies have shown that having any type of insurance, including Medicaid, is better than having no insurance at all. It increases access to care, gives people financial peace of mind if they're moving into Medicaid from pri private coverage. They're doing it because they're getting better value, better quality, or both. You know, I, I, I get, I bristle, Dr. Stark, when I hear you talk about this because, you know, taxpayers are paying when people are uninsured. They go to the hospital, they don't get care. You talk about overutilization. I'd rather they go to the doctor, which is cheap, than they end up in the hospital, which costs thousands of dollars. And so, yes, the taxpayers of the state 
are paying for it in some fashion, but they're going to be paying less in the long run because people get preventative care because they have coverage and they go to the doctor, and that's a good thing. So, you know, Dr. Hill, in your experience, is getting people Medicaid coverage a bad thing, or does it help improve their health and financial security? Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Absolutely. When, when you have a patient that has insurance, they have a usual care source. So when they get sick, they can go and get care. If you're uninsured, you don't have a usual care source, and you're more likely to forego care, decide that I can't afford it, and end up in the hospital, which costs everybody money. And look, I, I, I'll tell you again, if the Republicans think that, the, and Dr. Burgess said it, that the reimbursement rate is too low, and that's why doctors you know, don't want to take Medicaid, then raise the reimbursement rate. I don't hear an alternative here other than abolish it. I don't, I, nobody said abolish Medicaid, thankfully, but you know, that's what it seems to be saying. Now, Professor Corlett, my Republican colleagues seem to think that before reform, the individual health insurance market, the place where people go to buy coverage if they don't get it through their job, was a great place to be. But the fact is more than 50 percent of people left their coverage in this market after one year and over 80 percent left after two years. Premiums could skyrocket if a person got sick. Many plans didn't cover key benefits like hospitalization. I was shocked to find out plans don't cover hospitalization. I mean, that's incredible. Anyway, uh, would you just tell us about people's ability to access coverage next year compared to before reform? And what can you tell us about changes in the stability and quality of coverage in the individual market uh, post reform? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pallone, for the question. The individual market before the Affordable Care Act reforms go into full effect is an extremely inhospitable place. Um, as Business Insider Magazine said recently, it's a basket case. Nobody is in the individual market unless they're forced to be there um, because they're in between jobs or they're self-employed or they're an early retiree and they haven't yet uh, gained Medicare eligibility. Um, it is a place where you can be denied health insurance because you have a pre-existing condition. In fact, the GAO has said that between 9 and 40 percent of applicants are denied because uh, they have some kind of health health issue. Uh, you can be rated up because you have a health condition. Um, and uh, if you do have, if you are able to get coverage, many plans actually impose what's called an elimination rider on your coverage, meaning that any health condition that you come to the policy with is permanently excluded from your coverage. What's also common in this market is what are called teaser rates. So some a healthy person might be offered a really low premium rate early on, but as the as the that group of policyholders gets older and sicker every year, their health insurance premiums ratchet up and ratchet up to unsustainable rates. All of that will be prohibited under the Affordable Care Act so that you are guaranteed access to coverage, you are guaranteed no more discrimination because you have a health condition, and insurance companies will not be able to drop you or jack up your rates uh, because you get older and sicker. So, Chair, Chair thanks, gentlelady. <coughs> Uh, Chair, now I recognize the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you um, for for being here. I just want to go down go down the line. Dr. Stark, I'll start with you. Uh, yes or no, uh, would you consider the healthcare.gov rollout to be a success or a failure? Can you pull your it's mic a up a little bit, Marsha? Sure. Thanks. It's a, it's a failure. Failure. I think that there's some glitches, but I, people are... Success or failure? Success. Success. Okay. Congresswoman, I am a lawyer and an academic, and I'm incapable of providing a one-word answer. I would say that it is a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> he will ask you for yes or no. So then you don't know whether, Ms. Corlett, it is a success or a failure. The jury is still out. Okay, the jury is still out. Failure. 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 Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, three are able to answer in one word. I will tell you, according to my constituents in Tennessee, this is an abysmal failure. And uh, it is truly on display a lack of leadership, whether it be from this president, from uh, those that were 
charged with implementing this are those who were to deliver a final product, whether it's the contractors or whatever. And while we don't blame rank and file employees, if you will, what we do is hold responsible those who were supposed to be in charge of this rollout. It is a failure. I think the American people know that this is a failure. And if we expect, if we say this is a success, then we are saying we don't expect a finished product delivered on time, delivered on budget, with exceptional qualities from those that are spending taxpayer money. Every penny that was spent on this is taxpayer money. So no, it is not a success. In my opinion, and that of my constituents, it is an abysmal failure. It is a disservice to the American people, and it is a shame that the administration would have rolled this out without underpinning it properly. Uh, to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that say we have no alternative, may I highlight for you, we've been offering alternatives and options for health care reform since 2006 whether it's the SGR fix, a cross-state line purchase of health insurance, portability, requiring uh, insurance companies to be responsible, allowing individuals to have health care expense and insurance deductibility just like big businesses do. And Ms. Corletta, I have to tell you that uh, you made the statement that no one chooses to be in the individual market unless forced to be there. I take exception to that. As a small business owner, as so many of my constituents are small business owners, they choose to be able to purchase their health insurance. They choose to take control of their health care responsibilities. They think personal responsibility is a good thing. And because of the fact that there are millions of, Amer of Americans who do like to be in the health insurance, individual health insurance, and small business health insurance marketplace. That is why we have seen health savings accounts have such an enormous popularity among the American people. It is an absolute shame that this president said, if you like what you have, you can keep it. And I think the jury is still out as to whether or not he was a part of those conversations as whether or not to decide between the political and the policy ends if that could continue to be said. But it is incredibly unfortunate that he continued to say that. And I think it is unfortunate that those who were involved in this rollout never whispered to him that he might not want to be saying that. So whether it was his decision or bad staff work, I guess we'll find that out later. But we on this side of the aisle do have patient-centered, patient-centered, different proposals that we are bringing forward and have been for many years. And I would be more than happy to submit those for the record, Mr. Chairman, if our colleagues would choose to read them and like to read them and maybe join us in supporting some of these or even supporting the delay of this or support Mr. Upton's bill to allow people to keep their plan if they would like to. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. Now I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to reading uh, this proposal because we've worked on this issue for a very long time and the Republicans wouldn't come forward with anything. To if replace, the gentleman will uh, yield. No, the gentleman will not yield. Across they didn't come forward with any insurance. proposal. At, any proposal at all. They even said they want to repeal the Affordable Care Act and replace it. They've never given us a replacement. Now, I want to ask the panel, if there were a system where nearly 50 million Americans could not get health insurance because they had pre-existing medical conditions and no one wanted to insure them, or they couldn't afford a policy, or they didn't have a, a policy that covered essential services, or that the drug costs were higher if they were on Medicare, or that an insurance company could increase their premium if they got sick, or that they were forced into personal bankruptcy because their health care bills were not covered and they had to pay for it. Would you consider that system a success or a failure, Mr. Astrew? 
I think, uh, and I think I success or failure. <laughs> I've never been content with the American health care system. Okay, Mr. Failed. Roy, success or failure? It's not accurate to say 57 million people are denied insurance because of pre-existing conditions. It's Excuse only me. about you. You're you're incorrect. Nearly 50 million Americans do not have insurance. But not I went through of these conditions, conditions of what the existing system has been. Is that a success or a failure? The existing system is not a success, but so, it's not because insurance. Excuse me, I don't want to hear your explanations about it. It's I want a one-word answer. Too expensive. Uh, Ms. Ms. Corlett, uh, Mr. Roy couldn't say whether it was success or failure. He wanted to give me a whole diatribe about it. I want a one-word answer. Is the existing system where nearly 50 million Americans are uninsured a success or a failure? Failure. Reverend Hill? Failure. Dr. Stark? One word, success or failure, or no opinion? The present system is broken. Thank you very much. The present system is broken, and we try to fix this system. Now, the Affordable Care Act took a lot of these Republican ideas, private insurance companies, personal responsibility to be covered, get insurance coverage, uh, that uh, insurance companies couldn't just go out and set these rules and rates that, that excluded people from coverage rather than spread the costs. That's what we need in the insurance system. Professor Corlett, tomorrow the House is going to vote on a bill uh, that the Republicans are putting forward. It's, it's misleadingly called Keep Your Health Plan Act. You're a, a, an expert in the health insurance market. So I'd like to get your perspective on how this is going to affect uh, premiums and mo the market generally. Here's what the bill would do. The bill would not require health insurance to allow individuals to keep their health care plans. Uh, it, would, it would not require the health insurers to offer those plans. It would uh, allow any health insurance plan for sale in 2013, January 2013, to be sold all through 2014 wouldn't require that the plan be there, but it would allow people to buy it if it were there. These plans could remain in the market even if they exclude people based on pre-existing medical conditions, which means they're insuring people who are the least risky. They, the insurance company can impose these harsh limits on coverage or exclude key benefits like hospitalizations or mental health care. Just imagine, you buy a policy, and then if you need to go to the hospital, the plan is not going to cover you. And even though these plans do not meet the Affordable Care Act's consumer protection standards, these plans uh, would not just be available to those who own them, but this bill would allow people to buy into them who didn't have coverage and now could choose that coverage. What? Give us some context. Uh, prior to the reform, people were always able to keep their insurance from year to year in the individual market, but the market or the plan could change dramatically from year to year. If this legislation became law, what type of impact would this have on the new health insurance marketplaces and in the, on the premiums in 2015? Thank you, Congressman. Um, there's two issues with this bill. First of all, it doesn't solve the problem it purports to solve. It doesn't stop insurance companies from discontinuing policies if they choose to do so. The second issue is just as you point out, it will result in risk segmentation. It will mean that healthy people get carved out of uh, the regular marketplace into these older, old 2013 plans. That will lead to an increase in premiums for 2015, as well as fewer choices for the millions of Americans on the exchange as insurance companies leave that market, because it will result in what's called an insurance death spiral or adverse selection against the exchanges. The Republicans oppose this law. They fought it every step of the way. They thought that the court would throw it out. They thought the American people would elect uh, a Republican for president. And now we have voted over 40 times to repeal the law. And now they're carrying the on again trying to uh, attack the uh, opportunity to cover Americans in private health insurance plans. The gentleman's time's expired. The chair recognized the uh, chair emeritus of the full committee, Mr. Barton, five minutes for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's, let's try to, before I ask a question, set the record straight a little bit. Most of what we now call the Affordable Care Act uh, came through this committee. 
Chairman Waxman was the full committee chairman and Congressman Pallone was the subcommittee chairman. So for better or worse, they des deserve the lion's share of the authorship uh, for this this law. And at at full committee, the Republicans did offer an alternative. And I believe on the floor, we offered an alternative. I know we offered a motion to recommit. So it's not correct to say that we didn't have an alternative. We did. It wasn't successfully voted on, but it, it was offered. As we sit here today, the Republican Study Committee has an alternative. And I think in fairly short order, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Gingrey, Dr. Cassidy, and Dr. Burgess, with the help of the full of the subcommittee chairman, Mr. Pitts, could put a, a very good alternative together in, in probably two or three days. So if all the Democrats need to, 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 to move away from the Affordable Care Act as a Republican alternative, uh, I believe we can I believe we can accomplish that in fairly well, uh, gentlemen short deal, order. Would this plan protect people from being discriminated against because of pre-existing medical conditions? I think would it answer, stop insurance companies from setting lifetime limits and raising rates? Would it well, cover people who can't afford to pay for their coverage? Sure, regular order. Gentlemen. I would say yes, yes, and yes. Well, I want to see that plan because it wasn't offered when I was chairman. Well, when you were chairman, you didn't give us a chance to work together on a bipartisan basis, Mr. Chairman. And that's a fact. You know better than no, that. I don't. You know than that. True story. The day the Democrats introduced their bill, we were supposed to have a brown bag lunch hosted by myself and Mr. Waxman about an hour before we were, about two hours before the lunch, Mr. Waxman called me and said he was going to have to postpone the lunch. When I asked why, he said, because we're introducing our bill. Now, that's the truth, Henry, and you know that. That's the truth. That wasn't the end of time for working together. That was putting out no. our proposal. We want no. to hear your response. You did, you did tell me we could co-sponsor the bill if we wanted to. I doubt that I said that. You did. You, you said wouldn't. you can still co-sponsor the so bill, still Joe. Can, you still can support the legislation because it's a good proposal. It's not right. being implemented well on the It's web. so good that 106,000 people And uh, a lot of people are unhappy up. about losing their insurance, and we've got to try to deal with yeah. that Mr. Problem, Barton, uh, but not undermine the, the whole law. <clears throat> in, in my state of Texas, according to figures provided to me by Dr. Burgess, who is a very good researcher, less than 3,000 people signed up for the Affordable Care Act. In the two, in the, large, the largest, I'll give, I'll give Chairman Waxman credit. California is responsible for a third of the sign-ups, a third. So that's, what, 33, 34,000 people. But in the next two most populous states, Florida and Texas combined, fewer than 6,500 people have signed up. There'll still be now, time. If this, if this law is so good, then lots more people than that would be signing up. I have a bill. It hasn't had a hearing yet, and I hopeful, hopefully this subcommittee will have a legislative hearing on it, that doesn't repeal, and it doesn't delay, but it does make the Affordable Care Act voluntary the first year. So if it's that good, once the website gets fixed, and I'll stipulate that at some point in time in my lifetime it will be fixed, you know, then let the people choose. Now, but my question <laughs> In the next 50 seconds, I'm going to go to Mr. Roy. Over time, do you expect that employers will drop their, their health employees from their health care plans because it costs them more to pay the premiums, less the tax credit, than the penalty would be if they put them in the exchanges and paid the penalty? It depends on the sector and the industry. So, for example, in industries where you have a lot of low-wage workers like restaurants and other franchise businesses, you're likely to see a lot of sorting in that regard. Uh, high paid, like a law firm perhaps will not because the, the tax exclusion for employer-sponsored coverage is, is a, a more advantageous uh, expectation. But in many industries they will. Yes. At least that's the expectation. And could you tell us, Mr. Mr. Waxman cut you off, what percent of the population right now <clears throat> has a pre-existing condition 
that has not been able to get health insurance because of that condition? Estimates vary, uh, but the most credible estimates put the number at about one million people. So the vast, ma the vast majority of people who are uninsured, it's not because of because insurers are mean or because they have pre-existing conditions. It's because health insurance is too expensive. And the fundamental problem with the Affordable Care Act is it makes individually purchased health insurance even more expensive for most people. And if you had a, if you had a system that 85 percent of the people were satisfied with, would you say that system was a success? Not necessarily. Unfortunately, in, in the United States, <laughs> the health insurance system is, is too expensive. Health care is too expensive, and we could do a lot more to make health insurance right. more affordable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Chair, thanks, unanimous gentlemen. consent request, if I might be recognized. I'd like the gentleman. Do we have Texas, unanimous consent? I'd like the gentleman from Texas to be given an additional minute because I took up some nah. of his time. No, it was, it was productive. <laughs> it, was, it was very entertaining. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the chair recognized the distinguished uh, ranking member emeritus, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. <coughs> Wonderful hearing, highly political, and we're talking about what we're going to do in, uh, to repeal or fiddle around with this legislation rather than to perfect it. I'm rather touched that my friends on the other side have developed a newfound concern for the uninsured and those who have been treated poorly by the insurance company. This outrage rings rather hollow to me when for decades we heard nothing from the other side of the aisle about the outstanding and long-standing abuses in the individual market. Let me give you a couple of little stories here. Let's talk about Judith Groths of Macomb, Michigan comes from a 2012 article in Consumer Reports. She received a diagnosis of breast cancer, faced a, a $30,000 hospital bill. Her policy would only cover $1,000 for outpatient treatment and $2,000 for hospitalizations. Because of this huge expense, she delayed treatment until it's almost too late. Another story. This is about a family in Colorado. They took their daughter to get an ear tube insertion and found that the procedure used all of the health benefits for one year. The individual market was broken before ACA, which is an attempt to put together a system of health care which will take care of people like this. And for the first time now, consumers have protections against these destructive practices. And we must not forget that when discussing the impact of the law. Now, these questions are for you, Professor Corlett of Georgetown. I hope you can give me a yes or no. Uh, I just told a few stories about folks who hit lifetime limits on their, prior, on their care prior to passage of ACA. Was this a commonplace prior to the passage of the law, yes or no? Yes. Now, Professor... In fact, your testimony notes that you found that there are 20,000 people who hit these limits annually and 18 million people who had plans with such limits. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, will these same people benefit from the new consumer protections benefiting lifetime limits on ACA, yes or no? Yes, sir. Now, in your testimony, you note that before ACA, people with very minor health conditions, such as hay fever, were denied coverage by insurance companies. Is that correct? It is, sir. It also was possible that a woman could be denied care because she was a woman, right? She could be charged more, certainly, yes, sir. Now, is it true that some health insurance companies maintained underwriting guidelines that listed more than 400 medical conditions? as reasons to permanently deny someone coverage, yes or no? Yes, sir. Now, how many non-elderly Americans have at least one pre-existing condition? It could be as high as 129 million, million, million Americans have some form of pre-existing condition, sir. Now, before ACA, this population was in great jeopardy of not getting access to care because the insurance company couldn't cover them because of their pre-existing condition. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that could do things uh, to people who, for example, had had cancer five years previously. They could be denied because they had a pre-existing condition. 
Is that right? That's right, sir. Now, is it prohibited for an insurance company to use health status and gender to set premium rates under the ACA, yes or no? Yes, sir. And under ACA, only age, tobacco use, geographic location, and family size are used to calculate premiums. Is that correct? It is, sir. Now, we have heard a lot about health plans being canceled in the individual market. Professor, is this a new phenomenon, yes or no? It is not. It's been going on a long time. They cancel and they can change it every year. Is that right? That's right, sir. Now, how many of these of, of these cancellations that we're hearing about, about are caused by the Affordable Care Act, and how much of them, and, or how many of them, are being caused by the whim of the insurance company? Well, that I don't know. We don't know the exact numbers, um, but certainly in many states, insurance companies. Uh, have a choice. They can either discontinue a non-compliant policy or they can bring their policy up to the standard of the Affordable Care Act. So in point of fact, oftentimes this is done by the fact that, that the policy either doesn't meet the standards of Affordable Care Act and is the kind of policies that we discussed earlier where people uh, can't get proper coverage or it's done because the insurance company just decides we're going to cancel uh, the policy. Is that right? Gentlemen's time has expired. You're kind. Could I just get a yes or no on that, and then I'll be delighted to yield the floor. Yes, sir. Thank All you. right. The chairman, chair now recognizes the courtesy. vice chairman, Dr. Burgess, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just in the spirit of where we've been this morning, I, I want to also offer a couple of philosophical observations. Um, Ms. Blackburn from Tennessee made note of the fact that purchasing insurance across state lines was a Republican idea. This is one that has been co-opted by the Obama administration. My understanding is that people on my district staff are now going to be required under the new tenets of the Affordable Care Act to purchase their insurance in the D.C. exchange. And for those of you unfamiliar with the geography, there is a state line between Texas and Washington, D.C. But my employees in my district office will be required to purchase across state lines. Mr. Chairman, I think this would be a very good time for our committee to revisit the concept of purchase of insurance across state lines, since the administration clearly has no trouble with that. Dr. Stark, I am so grateful to see you here today. I, I just can't tell you. This bill that was signed into law was the Affordable Care Act was a House bill, but it was a House bill that was drastically changed by the Senate. It was H.R. 3590. When the House worked on it, it was a housing bill. The House did work on a health care bill. It was H.R. 3200, but that's been lost into the mists of time. No one has seen it for years because H.R. 3590 was a product that came over from the Senate, which was vastly different from H.R. 3200. But still, through all of the hearings that our committee had on H.R. 3200, uh, would you care to guess the number of doctors who sat at this witness table and, and uh, testified to us on H.R. 3200? If your answer were zero, it would be correct. So the fact that we have you here today, to me, is a, a, it's, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. And the fact that you're an AOA member, uh, worthy to serve the suffering, a doctor's doctor, I, I welcome you here today, and I think it's, uh, you're, you're, wor you're certainly deserving of the high praise. One of the ironic situations is that uh, in Camden, New Jersey, there was a family physician, Jeffrey Brenner, who came and talked to us at the Commonwealth Fund several years ago. I think it was 2010. Dr. Brenner showed a picture of his building, his family practice. It was a stone building that was there in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, someone asked him if he still had the practice, and he said, no, I, I had to close it. They asked why, and he said, because of Medicaid. And it is your observations about the difficulties with Medicaid that I think Dr. Brenner was also referring to that day back in 2010, because herein is a problem. You have access to a coverage card, but no access to actual care. Is that, did I understand your testimony correctly there? Yes, that's, that's absolutely correct. Yes. And, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to get to be at the Supreme Court of the day, the, the second oral argument, the second day of the oral arguments. Um, I had some problems with the uh, the assertions that were there that the reason health care costs so much in this country is because people don't buy insurance and it's these darn free riders. Man, these free riders are just costing us so much money. But 
Dr. Stark, in your experience, the people who are covered under the expanded Medicaid in your state who don't actually have access to a physician because the physician is not taking new Medicaid patients into their practice, where are they going to go when they have right lower quadrant pain at 3 o'clock on a Saturday morning? Well, they'll still use the emergency room or they'll use, a, they'll use a clinic. They will not be denied care. Well, they probably won't use the clinic at 3 o'clock in the morning, and we all know how human behavior is. I hope it'll get better, so I'm not going to do anything about it right now. Uh, but we really have done nothing to impact or lower the utilization of some of the high-cost access points in the system by just simply expanding Medicaid. I really wish it were that simple, but it's clearly not, as, as, as you so eloquently alluded to. Um, you know, the concept of a high-deductible plan, I don't have a problem with that. I've had a high-deductible plan since 1997. It's been able to be coupled with a health savings account. I, I guess what bothers me now about the Affordable Care Act is you're going to have a lot of people with high-deductible plans. Under the Blondes plan, the actuarial value is 60%. That's a high-deductible plan. That's sixty or 6000 or $6,500 deductible, and yet there's no possibility of marrying that with a health savings account. If we'd really wanted, if we'd been serious about holding down the cost of coverage in this country, we would have brought Governor Mitch Daniels in here to this very witness table, chained him to the table leg until he told us how he was able to reduce costs in his state for state employees by 11 percent over two years. And the answer was coupling a high deductible health plan with a health savings account. Mr. Roy, you looked like you wanted to answer very much when uh, <laughs> when some of the discussion was going on earlier about the, the, the pre-existing population. I, I know you have some thoughts about that. Would, I, I mean, let's be honest, in the in large employer market, pre-existing condition problems don't exist, do they? Well, one, one way we can measure what the, uh, the true population of people who were uninsurable due to pre-existing conditions is, is the pre-existing uh, pre conditions program and the Affordable Care Act. Uh, which, which only enrolled, I believe, at the end, 200,000 people. And in order to sign up for that program, you had to have been uninsured for, I believe, six months, and it was that uninsurance had to have been because of a pre-existing condition. Only 200,000 people signed up for that program. And let me ask you this. How many people have signed up since February 1st of this year? I believe it's closed down now, right? That is correct. They are not allowing people to show, show up because they've mismanaged the problem so poorly that it's not even there to take care of the number one problem they said we had to correct. Right. This is what government management will get you. When, in your experience, has the infusion of vast amounts of federal dollars resulted in a lower price for anything? I'm thinking banking, housing. Never, never in my experience, and I would just add that I do think the pre-existing conditions problem is an important problem, but the idea that there's these tens of millions of Americans who can't get insurance because of pre-existing conditions is absolutely not true, and it's, and it's not a contribution to uh, a, an honest uh, debate about our health care system, which does have a lot of flaws, uh, uh, to, to say otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman, Mr. Butterfield, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the uh, witnesses for your testimony today. Uh, you know, uh, I've heard a lot of complaints today about the enrollment data uh, that we received on yesterday, and it's all over the news today, and the President ought to begin talking about it in, in just a few minutes. Uh, but the Republicans are attacking the administration for not releasing enough data, uh, for not releasing it often enough, and of course for not getting enough people enrolled in coverage. The arguments are quite strange to me personally, uh, especially given the fact that Republicans really don't want people, in my opinion, uh, to sign up for this program. Uh, why do I say that? I say it because your behavior and your repeal efforts uh, over the last three years suggest that you really don't want to exert the energy and the political capital to make this thing work. The administration is releasing enrollment numbers monthly, just like they do with Medicare and the CHIP program and other federal programs. And that's what they've promised from the very beginning. Uh, let me tell you what else the administration has promised. The, the administration has also promised to do what every leader in this country has tried to do over the last 50 years, and that is to fix a seriously flawed uh, system. Uh, there is a lot of interest in this, obviously, but I don't believe daily or weekly enrollment numbers really make that much of a difference. The Republican legislation uh, to require more reporting is not the repo product of some newfound interest in making the law work. It is an attempt to place an excessive administrative burden on the department while providing no real benefit to the public. In terms of the numbers themselves, 
we knew enrollment would be low in the early days. We knew that. that we, we've had past experiences just like there were in Massachusetts. And so let me uh, start with you, uh, Ms. Corlett, or Dr. Corlett. Uh, you, you study these issues. Did you expect the majority of people to sign up for coverage at the very beginning of the program, or did you expect things to sort of ramp up over a six-month period? Absolutely not. And past experience with rollout of other programs, like in Massachusetts, like with Medicare Part D, uh, people don't enroll right away. And certainly there's no reason to enroll right away when the coverage doesn't start until January 1st. So I think we'll see a big uptick in mid-December when people need to sign up for January 1, and then we'll see another uptick in March when people need to sign up at the end of the open enrollment. But I wouldn't expect to see a lot of enrollment in October, or regardless of the issues with the website. And as I understand it, our research seems to suggest that Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, only signed up 0.3 percent, three-tenths of one percent of overall en enrollees for private coverage in the first month. Thus far, 1.5 percent of the ACA's target enrollment have signed up. Some of those in my district, not enough, but they are signing up. It is not fast enough, but I am hoping, hopeful that we are on the right track. And so I want to thank you, uh, all of you, for your testimony today. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm going to try to get back to, to Medicaid. But before, um, uh, Professor Collette, you've stirred a lot of interest. Um, and just because of your opposition to the Upton bill, and I hope you're as much opposed when the president, in a few minutes, says he's going to do an administrative fix to do what you so adamantly claimed is a failed policy. Um, I would also, uh, just to put on record, that 200,000 people who have coverage and have pre-existing conditions have lost it under catastrophic plans that have been dropped throughout states because they don't meet the minimum requirements under this law. The, um, and the administration has promised if you like your health care plan, you can keep it, period. That's what he said, and that was a lie. It was not correct. It was deceptive to the American people, and, you know, we, we're all receiving the letters of denied plans, and uh, even from hardened Democrats. I got one here from um, a strong Democratic family from San Francisco. Uh, they're cradle Democrats, and they say, from all the sob stories I've heard and read, ours is the most extreme. They've lost their plan. So this is not Republican, Democrat. This is affecting all our constituents, and it's, uh, it's, it's very um, frustrating. The, uh, the other thing I want to raise, uh, Ms. Collette, do you know that when you go on the Obamacare website that uh, I was interested in your comment about teaser rates. You know who's the, most, the biggest abuser of teaser rates right now? Healthcare.gov. Did you know that? And you know why? That's a question. Professor Collette, do you know why? I wasn't sure if you were being rhetorical or not. No, I'm, I'm asking that question now because it's very important. Because I've raised this numerous times in hearings. When I spoke about teaser rates, what I was talking oh, okay. about is uh, in the individual market. Okay, let me, let me just, re let me just reclaim my time here. Coverage. Let me reclaim my time. If, if, you were, if you would define teaser rates as offering a, a lower rate than what's it, at the end sold, if if you knew that the healthcare website uh, will will quote a 50-year-old the price of a 27-year-old, wouldn't you consider that a teaser rate? No, it's a different situation. Oh, okay, okay, I got it. a lawyer. I mean, you can say yes or about, no I think when you're you get the about... questions from the Democrat side, but you can say yes or no <laughs> when you get the questions. You're talking about likewise I think a if you're glitch. a 62-year-old and you, get, you go up on the website to get the price, and they quote you the price of a 50-year-old, wouldn't you consider that a teaser rate? I would call that a mistake. And I would call the health care law a mistake. So uh, we're even on, on that one. Uh, Dr. Stark, um, my big issue is this, this Medicaid concern. I, I've visited hospitals. I've talked to counselors. I've talked to uh, navigators. In one hospital that has the contract, 
uh, just last week they signed up 48 people. I asked them, well, how many of those Medicaid people are new enrollees based upon the new standard? And one of the, I was in the boardroom, so I had a lot of big wigs there. And, and the one said, well, I think all of them. And I said, I bet it's not. So the person who was actually monitoring said, 24%, or as we term out of the woodwork, 24 were new enrollees. So Illinois is a 50-50 state. That's just one small section. How is that going to disrupt Medicaid delivery and the cost to the state of Illinois and the Medicaid system if this 50% if this enrollment number is true across the country, which I think it's going to be? Yeah, that, that's a real good question. And the answer is it, the, the uh, burden on state taxpayers is definitely going to go up uh, because of the existing Medicaid patients newly enrolled now because of the public relations. Which wasn't planned for because uh, in, when the bill was proposed, the promise to states was the new enrollees, you would get 100% of the, for the first three years, and then it goes down to 90%. But no one really believed that these out of woodwork folks would be so high that they're going to cause a, finan a huge financial burden on not just our state of Illinois, but in every state that has Medicaid, which is a reason why maybe some of the Republican governors understood the additional financial burden, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and plus, there's an additional build in the law, uh, an additional 10 percent that state taxpayer is going to have to pay ultimately. Uh, Washington is a 42, 58 percent state, so uh, Washington state taxpayers are going to be on the hook for 42 percent in these woodwork or welcome mat patients. Yeah. I'll tell Governor Inslee we all said hi. He's a friend of ours. Yeah, chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Corlett, thank you for coming to speak with us today about your research and on the failures of the individual insurance market and the impact of the Affordable Care Act. Um, I represent a very urban district in Texas, and uh, we not only have the highest number of uninsured in the country percentage-wise, uh, but in our district uh, we have some of the highest in, uh, in the country per congressional district of uninsured people who work. Like many of my colleagues, I'm frustrated over the troubled rollout of the health, federal health exchanges. I want to see every action taken to fix the website as soon as possible so we can deliver on the promise of providing millions of uninsured and underinsured Americans access to the affordable quality insurance. But I think it's important to remember why the ACA came to be and to reflect on the sy systemic problems of the individual insurance market that left 48 million P Americans uninsured featured rampant adverse selection and rising premiums in families and individuals with coverage that provided low value and little security from bankruptcy if they got sick. I use the example, uh, I had a constituent who worked for a retail operation that uh, went to the doctor and discovered she had a tumor. Her policy that was issued through her employer had a cap of $25,000. Uh, that surgery at Memorial Hermann Hospital, a great facility in Houston, was over 250000 um, that employer uh, was ashamed enough to help uh, to pay for that instead of having the, either the taxpayers or the nonprofit side of that hospital have to pay for it. Can you remind me of all the failures of the individual health insurance market and the important reforms included in the ACA to address these? Why was the individual market uh, so broken prior to the uh, passage of the Affordable Care Act? Well, I think uh, one thing that clearly happened to your constituent and uh, happens to many, many uh, Americans in this market is that this coverage is, is inadequate to meet people's needs uh, when they have health care issues, just like any of us um, would. So, um, you know, in, in this situation, you have, uh, as you point out, health plans that prior to the ACA had really low annual limits. Um, the high, high deductibles um, often excluded things like prescription drugs, maternity, mental health services, um, coverage that was like an umbrella full of holes, would not be there when the person actually needs the, to use it. The joke it. in some of my community is that we pay insurance premiums, but when we need it, it's not there. And that was the image. Um, and I only have uh, five minutes, so I'm going to ask. Yeah, 
In our health care system, people receive emergency medical treatment for life-threatening situations in emergency, regardless of whether they have insurance. What's the overall impact on the cost of health insurance premiums and the health care system in general, having these people without coverage using the, med uh, the emergency room? Uh I believe some of the estimates that I have seen is we all pay an additional thousand dollars on our premiums to make up for the this um, free care that uh, people get in emergency rooms, but I'm not exactly sure of the number. But it is a significant surcharge on all of our premiums that we pay to cover um, this kind of um, uncompensated care. Well, and one of the concerns I have is part of the Affordable Care Act was the expansion of Medicaid to a lot of constituents that I have who are, are working poor. They work, but they don't have enough. They can't afford it. Their employer doesn't provide it. And yet uh, states like my home state of Texas did not expand Medicaid. Hopefully we'll get a new governor and, and make that decision differently because that impacts all my hospital systems. Every one of them would prefer the expansion of Medicare. Even my Great Houston Partnership, our Chamber of Commerce, lobb lobbied in Austin to have that. So we understand the, the spreading of the risk and having people have an instrument uh, of insurance, whether you Medicaid or the Affordable Care Act going in. The principal insurance and any type of insurance is to provide real financial protection to individuals and family through risk pooling. Um, there have been reports of people currently in the individual market receiving letters about planned cancellations. Health insurance touches everyone's lives deeply and personally. Can you provide an explanation on why these letters are sent and their connection to the Affordable Care Act? Sure. Um, I think there's there's three options that people are often given if a health insurance company has decided to um, discontinue a policy. Um, many policyholders are being encouraged to early renew their plans, um, and typically that would mean that they would just move up the anniversary date of coverage um, so that it would renew in 2013, so they would get up to an extra year on their plans. Um, the other option that people are often given is to um, purchase an ACA-compliant plan through the same company or to research their new coverage options on the exchanges. Uh, Close to 50% of these individuals will be eligible for premium tax credits on the exchanges. And so millions, millions will get a far better deal on the exchanges than they can currently find in the individual market today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your Chairman, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dr. Murphy, five minutes for questions. Thank you. Uh, Abraham Lincoln um, once asked how many legs does a dog have if you call a tail a leg. And his response was four, uh, because calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Or said another way, uh, George Orwell once said, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. So I'm going to ask you folks to uh, respond to me truthfully. Uh, as we are here, the president is announcing that he is allowing the states to make decisions uh, to maintain the health insurance plans people currently have. He's going to leave that up to the governors. <clears throat> Quickly going down. Would each of you recommend that the governors from your state go ahead and allow people to keep their plan if they like it? Mr. Astru, start with you. <clears throat> That's a yes or no. Should the governor say people can keep their plan if they like it? Mr. Roy? I, I hopefully, yes, would have to know the details of what he, he's planning to. Mr. Barlett? I'd similarly, I'd have to see the details. Reverend? I agree. With what the yes. president's doing? What the president's doing? You agree with what the president is saying should happen? Details. The state should decide. Dr. Stark. Yeah, I would. I would say yes. From you would, what you've, from what you've said. We agree with the president, allowing the states to decide. That's a step in the right direction. All right. <clears throat> okay. Here's a couple other things. Just quickly, doing. Does this bill make it illegal to deny coverage to people based upon pre-existing conditions? The Affordable Care Act. Mr. Ask. The current bill, does it, yes or no, does it say it, you can't deny people coverage? Have you, you haven't read it. Okay, Mr. Roy? Is, yeah, it's simple. Mr. Roy? Uh, yes. Okay, it, it, Ms. Corlett, does it say you can't deny people coverage based on pre-existing conditions? It does. Okay. Reverend? It does. Dr. Stark? Yes. Okay, that's good. That's reality. Now, the other reality is some parts of this bill helps people, but other parts of the bill still leaves many people with unaffordable insurance. Uh, I've got a letter here, a 63-year-old says the equivalent Affordable Care Act plan is 37% more expensive than what I'm paying now. 
It's $19,200 a year under this bill. Another person, a single mom, writes to me that she is being offered a plan that she can't afford anymore. Another person says their bill is going up from 200 some dollars a year to 800 some dollars a year, 800 some, some dollars a month, from $200 a month. So isn't it true that while this bill is helping make it affordable for some people, it's also making it unaffordable for some people? Mr. Astor, is that true? Mr. Roy? Absolutely. Mr. Corlett? You've got to be able to answer that one. You um, must have some compassion to say that this is unaffordable for some people. Forget being a lawyer. Be a mom. Be well, a person. Is it unaffordable for some people now, yes or no? If you'll give me the opportunity to answer the question, I would say that yes, yes, yes or no. some people will pay more Thank than you. they have been paying. Is it going to be unaffordable for some people based upon those numbers? Do I think that the this is a simple tax question? Please, I ask you to tell the yes. truth here. Thank you, Reverend Hill. Is it going to be more unaffordable for some people based upon, for some people, not for all, but for some people now? For some people. Thank you, Doctor Starr. Yes. All right. Here's some other quick true and false things. It has been said that if you like your plan, you can keep it. Was that the truth, Mr. Astor? Mr. Roy, was that the truth? No, and it was never designed to be that way, Ms. Corlett. In order to fix the health insurance market, you have to change the health insurance I didn't ask you that. I asked you if that statement was true or false. When you tell people you like your plan, you can keep it. I don't need you to dance around this. I don't need a lawyer. I need honest answers. I asked you to do that for the sake of the American people. Was that true or false when people were told if you like your health care plan? Mr. You can Chairman, keep it? what is uh, I'm asking a question. The gentleman from Pennsylvania controls the time. Is it true or not? And I have to answer you that I cannot speak for the president and what he said. I can't I tell you, you that Ms. you Hill, read the bill. Reverend Hill, have is it true or not that people were told that if they like the health care, they can keep it? Was that a true statement? He that is what the president said, but... I, was, I didn't... You're, you're done. I'm Reverend Hill, is that a true statement or not? Is it true or not? He, uh, I can only say he made the statement. Reverend... He made this is statement. This, I, I didn't ask you if he made the statement. I'm asking you if it's a true Mr. statement. Mr. Chairman, he's being, they, they can't uh, tell what the president said. I agree all the time. I'm asking if it's true. I, mean, I didn't say the president. You said the president. Is it true or not? If someone was told no, that they like their plan. During the witness, it's, it's really not fair he to ask them. He made this statement. That's all I can say. I don't know what was in his mind. I didn't say the president said that. Lots of people said it. Dr. Stark, is that a true statement or not to say if you like your plan, you can keep it? It was absolutely false, and he either knew it was false or he is terribly naive. Thank you very much. I go back to the statement at a time of universal deceit, telling the truth as a revolutionary act. For those of you who tell the truth, I thank you. Yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Five minutes for questions, please. Well, it'll be interesting to see now that the president has uh, made a, a change that will um, allow people to um, keep the, the policies that, uh, that, that they have. Um, what the uh, other side will come up with and as, uh, as yet another excuse. And let's face it, all of the programs that we have rolled out, the big ones, Medicare Part D and, uh, have, uh, and, and Medicare and Social Security, have required Congress to help work. And I'm sure you know that as a, an actuary that we've had to make changes over time in these programs. We don't have a partner to do that. So the president is doing his best now to, to comply. But I think that there has not been enough conversation about some of the worst abuses that have been in the private market. We've done some of that uh, 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 t today to ensure that everyone has access to affordable health insurance. So some people are going to be offered, if the insurance companies want to, continue to offer them the plans they still have. Let's remember one of the big reasons that people can't keep the policies they have is because the insurance companies change them every year, and so they aren't available. But anyway, I went to um, uh, a... a, a eHealthInsurance.com, a, a website that allows people to, uh, to, to shop for insurance. And I looked at plans that were available in Cook County, Illinois. That includes my district. And let me just tell you one plan that I found. Um, yeah, the the Copay Select Value 10,000 plan offered by United Health One. Um, it has a $10,000 deduct, uh, deductible. 
and requires 30% coinsurance after the deductible has been met. Um, and this is the basic plan before any underwriting would take place on pre-existing conditions. The plan does allow doctor's visits with a $35 copayment before the deductible is met, but only four visits. Afterward, the customer has to meet the $10,000 deductible before the insurance company will pay any more for the doctor visits. At that point, the consumer would pay 30% coinsurance per visit, and then the plan has an out-of-pocket max of $10,000. But this cap doesn't include the $10,000 deductible the consumer may pay. So in addition to the consumers potentially facing $20,000 in medical bills each year um, for what is covered in the plan, let's look at what is not covered. Brand name prescription drugs, maternity services, mental health services, substance abuse services. Um, so, I, I mean... Should these kinds of plans ultimately, I want to ask uh, Ms. Corlett, is, is this good for our country that ultimately, maybe after a year, be allowed on the market? I wouldn't even call that health insurance. It doesn't offer the basic things that health insurance should provide, which is access to care and financial protection when you get sick. So that coverage uh, will no longer be allowable, and rightfully so. If I, if I may just take 10 seconds okay. and an attempt maybe foolhardy to get some consensus on this subcommittee. You've done something important, which is you've tried to shop, and that's a feature that's not built into healthcare.gov now. And so one thing that ought to bring us together as Republicans and Democrats is to work with the agency to try to let people to do it. I've tried to do it. You know, I haven't worked full-time since I left the government. I'm an interim employment, um, and I've tried to shop in very Massachusetts. Very frustrating. It's very frustrating. Totally. So, so if nothing else comes out of this hearing, maybe all of you can work together on a bipartisan way to stress to HHS that it's very important to change the design system that prevents Americans from doing what you just very importantly did on, 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 on you the You know, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, those of us who are supporters of the, the, the legislation, um, would like to be able to say to people, look, I just got this letter and I don't have my turn, to say, wait a minute, calm down, just go to the website and see if you can find a better deal for yourself. Of course, that is so very, very frustrating. All of us feel that. No one is ignoring um, that as a, 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 a unacceptable flaw uh, in the uh, in the in the rollout, um, it, you know, for those of us who support it, uh, maybe even more frustrating because we want to be able to show people that this is, is good. I want to say one other thing: Medicaid. Are you saying, doggone it, those people who are eligible for Medicaid have always been eligible for Medicaid? Now it's a big problem because they're coming out of the woodwork to sign up. God love them for coming out of the woodwork to get the kind of health care that they are eligible for. This is a good thing. And I yield back. And least time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingrey. Five minutes for questions, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, just an, an hour ago, I, I accompanied one of my uh, staff empl employees to the member services office of finance to check on what it's going to cost her. Uh, when she goes into this health link, DC health link exchange, she currently under the federal employee health benefit plan, uh, pays $90 a month as a single individual. Uh, her premium per month is going up to $270. She pays no deductible currently under FEHB. Uh, her deductible goes up to a thousand dollars. Uh, so she is paying up about $3,160 a month or a year more. And this is a 200% increase in what she currently is paying. Uh, members are, are, are uh, having 200, 300% increase in what they're paying. And this is with the uh, really uh, the unfair subsidy. That, that taxpayer, we the taxpayer subsidy that, uh, that the president convinced the Office of Personnel Management to grant to the members and their employees, even if their income doesn't meet the standards to get a subsidy. 
if, it, if, if they weren't getting that subsidy, uh, my employ employee, this young lady, would probably be paying 500 percent more. Uh, and it's even worse in the individual market. When you talk to individuals in my state of Georgia and the states of uh, members on both sides of the aisle, they can't deny it. There's no question about it. The president has consistently said that what is now reality would never happen, that if you like your health plan, you can keep it, period. That's also part of the quote, the period. And this is not proven to be true for the millions of Americans who have seen their plans canceled due to Obamacare and provider networks that have been narrowed to prevent even more sticker shock. Uh, look, th this was all about, should have been about, maybe in the individual market in particular, uh, reform of, of, of the health insurance market. I mean, that could be done. That could easily have been done uh, to allow uh, young people uh, up to the age 26 to stay on their parents' health insurance policy to make sure that, that children with pre-existing conditions could get health insurance to have high-risk pools within the states, which many states already have. But so what we, we did is spend about $2 trillion creating a whole new entitled program, uh, which is basically a one-size-fits-all, even though some 55-year-old uh, bachelor uh, now has uh, infertility and maternity coverage <laughs> that he's paying for, uh, but <laughs> I don't think he's going to ever need. Uh, but now I do believe this, and, I, and I'm going to get to the, my question, and it's going to be for Mr. Roy. I believe that there's another population that will soon feel Papaka's effects. What a misnomer. It should be the Aff Unaffordable Care Act. But this population has been underreported. We know that $716 billion was taken out of the Medicare program, Mr. Roy. Uh, $156 billion from Medicare Advantage. Uh, and really to uh, create this whole new entitled pro program. In the current individual market, we have seen individuals switch doctors as provider networks have narrowed, reimbursements have fallen within exchange plans. With the $415 billion cut in Medicare updates to fee-for-service payment rates to providers, to hospitals, uh, what is the likelihood that seniors may lose access to the doctors and be forced to try to find new ones? This is a, an emerging problem, and I know this committee has had uh, debates uh, about whether, whether or not access to physicians among, uh, among Medicare enrollees is a problem. Uh, from what I see and from the data I see broadly, not just MedPAC data, but, uh, but across the spectrum, it is an increasing problem, particularly for seniors who move to a new location. So a grandmother in New York who moves to North Carolina. To Let me switch real, real quickly to the, uh, the other follow-up on sure. that is in regard to Medicare Advantage, the $156 billion dollars that were taken out of Medicare Advantage. Of the 47 million people that have Medicare, 25 percent of them choose Medicare Advantage. What's going to happen to them? Uh, Richard Foster, the former uh, chief actu actuary of, the CM of CMS, said, uh, projected that 50 percent of Medicare Advantage enrollees would revert back to the traditional fee-for-service program uh, because of the, uh, of the changes to the Medicare Advantage program. Well, Mr. Chairman, the administration implies that the disruptions that Obamacare has caused to individuals will stay relegated to those buying their insurance individually. Our seniors need to be warned that this disorder will soon come to them uh, if it has not already. And this law is not just a disaster for individuals. It's a disaster for our health care system and will soon, soon be a disaster for our seniors. No amount of IT resources will fix the underlying problems. Uh, as, as Dr. Burgess said, that will be fixed eventually. Uh, that this is, this is the, 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 the end of the beginning of the problem, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, no amount of IT resources will fix the underlying problem. This bill is truly a train wreck for Americans and particularly for our seniors, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Dr. Cassidy, five minutes for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Corletta, Mr. Corletta, I'm sorry. I gather that you oppose uh, the preservation of the small group market? Uh, no, sir. Uh, so the folks getting cancellations, the rules that were written, effectively mean what 80 percent of those folks would lose. The, I'm not sorry, not small group. I'm sorry, the individual market, the individual market. Um, individuals whose policies are being discontinued at the end of this year 
um, many of them are getting three options. The first... But just simply, I gather that you would think it's a bad idea, the Upton Bill, for example, which allows people to continue in the individual market should they choose. I think the Upton Bill has two problems. One, it doesn't... No, just, I'm sorry, I have limited time. I'm just trying to rephrase and set, set a context for my next question. Would you agree that that... I believe there are a lot of inadequate, unaffordable policies on the individual market today that need to meet basic minimum, minimum standards to be considered health insurance. So the president reportedly is about to announce that he is going to either require whatever, insurance companies to continue to sell in the individual market. Uh, now, I gather that you think that's probably a bad decision. The policies currently being canceled reportedly will no longer have to be canceled. Honestly, sir, I'd have to look at the president's proposal to be able to speak. But in concept? It. In concept? I, I, I would have to look at the details. I of find you're willing to there. conjecture on things which um, support your position but not um, on things which don't. Uh, would you concede that the uh, young people not signing up for the exchanges is a potential problem? If they don't sign up by March 31st, it is a big problem. But and they do have until March 31st to sign up for coverage. And it's arguable whether or not young people will pay substantially more than the going rate to purchase something which they currently don't purchase. That's my perspective. But that said, if they don't, you spoke earlier of an actuarial death spiral. Is it fair to say that if the young people don't sign up, that the business plan is such that quite likely the exchanges will enter somewhat of that actuarial death spiral? It is critically important for young and healthy people to sign and up. And if they do not? There will be premium increases over time, yes, sir. And if it's assumed, CBO once said that for every 10% increase in premiums, you lose roughly 1.4% of subscribers, but of course that is a compounding effect. That increases premiums further and then more people unsubscribe. That's why it's called the death spiral, sir. <laughs> so now, Mr. Roy, Dr. Roy, Yes, sir. Uh, um, you have done stuff looking at apples and apples comparison, e-health versus the exchanges. I think young men in San Francisco are going to pay 40 percent more on the exchanges. Uh, what is your opinion as regards how likely these young men are to sign up for these exchanges? It, it depends on how much the mandate convinces them to sign up versus uh, the rate increases. But, my, but experience and our experience in Massachusetts and experience broadly suggests that the rate increases are far higher relative to the fine that people will pay uh, under the individual mandate, particularly in the first year. And therefore, we, we are likely to see adverse selection. In fact, we know from anecdotal reports, not from HHS, by the way, we know from reports from state governments that the average age of the enrollee on some, many of the state exchanges is higher than, than what people were hoping for or projecting. So it looks as if we are getting those folks basically over 50 or with chronic medical conditions signing up, but we're not getting the young people. That appears to be the case, and the website problems exacerbate that because the people who are most desperate for coverage are the ones who are most willing to put up with all the hassles of signing up. So our concern as Americans should be, because I agree with Mr. Astru, we need to look at this as Americans, not as one party or the other. We've scorched earth the individual market. But we've set up a system where young people don't appear to be signing up, only the older, and then we will end, in, end up with the actuarial death spiral so that even those who are older end up paying higher premiums than they otherwise would have paid. It, it will depend on whether they're eligible for subsidies. So if you're, if you're eligible for subsidies, the subsidy level will increase to, to cushion some of that. But if you're not eligible for subsidies, you will pay the full freight, the underlying but The subsidy premium. is only a percent. So even if, the, even if it's a percent, the percent that you're left in pocket will continue to rise. That's correct. And I have found that as a doctor who treats people, still treats the uninsured in a hospital for the uninsured, a clinic for the uninsured now, I have found that, that those who are poor are very sensitive to price increases. I think, don't we know that from Indiana or Wisconsin, that even, even minor increases in Medicaid co-pays cause a dramatic drop-off in people participating? We also know from the market research that insurers have done for the exchanges that they've publicly disclosed, uh, disclosed in their earnings calls that uh, the, the participants in the exchange are extremely price sensitive, and that's why these plans have narrow networks, because uh, insurers, carriers believe that narrow networks are preferable to higher premiums in a competitive market. Thank you all. I yield back. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my state of Kentucky has been listed as one of the states been supposedly successful with the exchange, but I will tell you, in the 1990s, our General Assembly completely destroyed our individual insurance market. So I understand New York is a state that's also 
been listed as being successful with this. And I will tell you, their General Assembly destroyed their individual insurance market. So I think California, which I'm not that familiar with, but it appears that other states are going to subsidize states that destroyed their individual insurance market. That seems to be what's happening. But having said that, Ms. Corlett, I, you said if, you, if, if you're going to fix the market, you have to change it. So people are going to be disrupted. You acknowledge that people are going to be disrupted when the health care bill is fully – or it's now. They're now being disrupted because of the impact of the health Now, a lot of people are saying insurance companies – cancel plans every year. That's true, but they usually offer similar plans. Plans are, don't be, we can't be mistaken, plans are being canceled because they don't meet the essential minimum benefits of the health care law. So people are being disrupted that way, correct? Yes, there is going to be some disruption as we move to a more fair system that lets people who've historically been barred from accessing insurance to allow them to access insurance. But if you don't disrupt people and put them to the exchanges, is what the bill that the Upton bill, you would, that's your criticism of it, and you said it creates a death spiral for the exchanges. The Upton bill passed would create a death spiral for the exchanges. That is one of the biggest problems with the Upton bill. And, and um, Mr. Congressman, I'd like to show you, this is a report on Kentucky's insurance reforms from the 1990s, and it's really instructive. I think everybody on the committee should read it. But what it says is what happened in Kentucky is that they created, they allowed a set of insurance products to be sold that operated on a different set of rules than the modified community rating. But not in the uh, individual market. That's the, that's the Right. Oh, and so but what happened was insurance left that mar left, the, left the, market. the reformed market in droves premiums went through the roof it's exhibit they, they, a they, of why they, we they need accepted the a whole holistic market. approach but they weren't offering you're, they weren't offering alternatives like letting you keep it if you have it they, they were offering left the market because they couldn't compete in all the mandates they that were put all forth. shifted to association products so and people were trying to buy everything they could because because it didn't affect employers because most of them were ERISA. So individual small business, individual buyers, farmers were, were completely priced out of the insurance market. We repelled those, but we destroyed the insurance market, and they didn't come back. So this, I mean, this is real serious stuff. What's happening? Not, this is going to be disruptive. We don't know. When you destroy an insurance market, we could not get it back in Kentucky. And so, but the thing, there was a farmer, and I ran in 1998 on this issue because that was the issue for everybody, who came to me, I remember, and he said he spent about $1,000 a month because he had to buy on the individual insurance market with 33 mandates. So you say, I think you quoted, quote, you say some, some of these plans are not health insurance. Well, somebody in Frankfurt decided that this farmer needed to have 33 mandated, mandates in his policy, paying $1,000 a month. And he came to me and he said, if I could just buy catastrophic, so if I have my wife or myself or the two kids have to go to the hospital, we don't lose the farm, I would love to be able to buy that. But if I got to, I'm spending $1,000 a month, well, I would rather pay a few hundred dollars when we have to go to the doctor to get tests or whatever out of pocket, and I'm money ahead if I do that, that's a rational buyer of health insurance, isn't it? So you're saying that you would say that's not health insurance, but having a catastrophic policy and paying out of pocket, particularly if you could do health savings accounts where they have first dollar coverage, is a rational way to buy health insurance. His price went up because he was subsidizing other people in the market that didn't have. He was family is fairly healthy, and that's so. So that's what's happening. It appears today. So you say the Upton bill will create a death spiral. If there's any similar proposal, whether the president's or not, that allows people to stay in these what these current policies you say are not health insurance, would that also create a death spiral? I can't speak to the president's proposal. Well, just any I'm proposal really that sorry. allows people I to stay. Well, you say the Upton, look at it. <laughs> you say the Upton bill would create it. Would it, if any similar essentially what the Upton, Upton bill, bill allows is a set of products to be continually. It's not just people being able to keep their policy, right. these insurers will be allowed to enroll new customers. If you allow a set of products to be sold on the marketplace that operate by a different set of rules, as Kentucky learned in the mid-90s, you will result in adverse selection. There will be adverse selection against the exchanges. And over time, premiums will go up in the exchanges and there will be fewer insurance options for people to choose from. But then you have people like my farmer who's priced out of the market because they're mandated to take coverages that they don't cover. So we're really using him and his family to subsidize other families. Well, I mean, all and of so us... so you're using Young Healthy to subsidize... All of us in employer-based coverage are in a risk pool. Healthy employees subsidize sicker employees. Younger employees subsidize healthier... Uh, old, older employees. What the Affordable Care Act attempts to do is bring that same employer-based risk pooling concept to the individual market. But if you allow 
risk segmentation. But most of these individuals aren't getting employer subsidies to participate in that. They're just being priced out of the market. Well, they're getting affordable um, advanced payments of premium tax credits up to 400% of poverty. Yeah, it depends to on help. the income level. It depends Correct. on the income level. I back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffiths, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Stark, let me uh, let me ask you a question. A problem has come to my attention in Virginia, which all the way across the country from you, and it may not be the same in, in the state of Washington. But we have a dilemma because in order to be eligible for Medicaid, you have to have limited assets. Uh, it used to be $2,000. That may have gone up in the last year or two. But it used to be $2,000 uh, were all you could have in assets in order to be eligible for Medicaid. So a situation has come to my attention where a lady has assets. She generates $9,000 a year from those assets. She's not yet old enough. She's a widow, but she's not old enough yet apparently to be in Medicare. And when she goes on the website, she's not offered a supplement in, a, in Obamacare because she would theoretically, based on her income level, be eligible for Medicaid, but because she has assets, that's where her small income comes from. She happens to be caring for also for apparently a disabled child. She's not eligible for a supplement, and with $9,000 a year in income, she cannot afford health insurance. Um, is that problem nationwide, or is that just a Virginia-specific problem? I think potentially that would be a nationwide problem. It's the way the, the system is set up. So it's going to apply in any state, depending on what the number is. Uh, if you have assets, you're going to have to sell your assets in order to qualify for Medicaid, and you won't be able to buy health insurance. Uh, pot potentially, I, I would say, yeah. It's interesting because uh, this lady, in speaking to a friend of mine, said, I thought Obamacare was supposed to help people like me, and apparently it's not uh, helping her because she's not going to be able to get any assistance whatsoever. Uh, and in some cases, I understand the asset may even be the home that they're living in if it's a, a single person living in that home where you don't have a, an, another person who may have ownership in the house. Is that also your understanding? Yeah, I, I think an asset is an asset, yeah. So in theory, they can either be uninsured, which is where they may have been anyway, but in theory, they can either be uninsured or homeless. Isn't that correct? That's... I guess by your definition, yeah, the yeah. way you're putting this, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a tough situation. Uh, Mr. Roy, would you like to comment on that? Do you have any different perspective? Um, the, 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 the biggest problem, there are a number of problems with the way the, the mandate is enforced. Um, uh, but I would say that in general, people can reorganize their income or sometimes misreport their income in order to avoid the mandate and maximize the subsidies. Well, now, we don't want to encourage anybody to misreport their income because that gets off close to fraud, but what, how would you manage that, that asset? Um, well, if your income is below that required to file a, a tax return, the mandate doesn't apply to you, for example. Oh, uh, so she wouldn't, have to pay the, the, she wouldn't have to pay the fine for being poor and having an asset, but she, but she still wouldn't have insurance. That's correct. Okay, so that's how she would manage her, her asset. That could be, that, that is one option, quote unquote. One option. Point. As long as she didn't have to file any tax return with the IRS. Right. Because the, the IRS otherwise can't verify your income, and the law actually explicitly states that if you uh, don't file a tax return, uh, if, you, if you, don't, you don't need to file a tax return, uh, you're not, the mandate doesn't apply to you. Mr. Griffith, if I could mention a parallel problem, sure. I would hope that the committee would try to ask the GAO to look at on a bipartisan basis. This country runs its defense these days a lot on young men and women who go in and out of the Reserve and National Guard uh, into full-time deployment and then come back. The ACA does not fit very well. People whose income goes up and down, the, uh, the, the, the enrollment periods don't fit their employment. We need to be looking at some sort of grace period for people coming back from deployment um, under the circuit. That's another group of young people who I think are going to be very alienated from this system if we don't figure out a way to treat them better. Well, and I appreciate that. And, and obviously, we've heard about a lot of problems, not only today, but, but other times. And, you know, when you have constituents who, who were supposed to be helped by this program who find themselves uh, not being helped and, and actually having equal or greater dilemmas than they had before. It, it just um, makes you realize, although I was not here at the time, 
that, that this wasn't a carefully crafted piece of legislation, and as a result, we have a very flawed uh, law. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. gentleman. Now recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to each um, ask every panelist here a very simple question. Um, I just want to kind of follow up on some of, the, some of the comments and exchanges that have taken place. One, do each one of you believe that in this country that the American people should take care of those who cannot take care of themselves with, with coverage such as Medicaid? And I'll start with you, Mr. Astrew. Yes, yes, but not with Medicaid. But not with Medicaid. Yes, generally. Generally, yes. Yes. Okay, I agree too. I agree that, that we should take care of those who cannot um, help themselves. Um, Ms. Corlett, in an exchange with Mr. Green from Texas, I believe Mr. Green asked you what the cost is today as, as health care coverage is, what the average individual pays to cover those who are uninsured. So to a health care coverage premium, I believe you said $1,000. But what, $1,000 a month, $1,000? Yeah, I, I'm really sorry, Congressman. I'm not sure of the exact um, additional amount that those of us with coverage pay okay. because of the uninsured. I just know we all pay more okay. because of uncompensated care. Okay, so, but when you s responded to Mr. Green and you said $1,000. That's the number I remember, but I. So that $1,000 a year? year? I think so. A thousand dollars a year. Okay. Well, see, the issue is, and, I, and Mr. Roy, I, I do have some questions for you, but I do, um, Reverend Hill. I, I want to back up to you and just say how you know you your situation, especially with the health care issues that you have faced. I can only imagine how devastating th those were, especially with the Guillain Barre. I've, I've taken care of patients, and I know how devastating and how how scared you must have been in many cases. So I, I just would like to say that. Um, but so the $1,000 issue. So we'll say a year or whatever. To that point, I, I think, you know, to me that justifies exactly what we're talking about, which is, you know, I'm hearing from uh, right now we have a number of 160,000 North Carolinians who are getting health care premium cancellations. And my understanding is it's, for, it's from one insurer in North Carolina. And the comparable or what the Affordable Care Act would call for as comparable coverage or now increased coverage, personally I say over coverage or over insuring, um, is going up by thousands and thousands of dollars depending on the individual, depending on the plan that they've had with increased amounts of in the thousands of their deductible. So I, my question is, if we're paying $1,000 more now with health care premiums, and the ACA premiums are going up by thousands of dollars. Are we fixing the problem, Mr. Roy? Yeah, you know, and I would just start by saying if, if we look at national health expenditures, only about 1.7% of national health expenditures are uncompensated care in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Of that 1.7%, only about a third are relevant to the population that is uh, that is that would be involved in enrolling in the exchanges or the Medicaid uh, expansion. So it's actually a tiny fraction of health expenditures that are driven by uncompensated care in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And yet, as I noted in my opening remarks, in North Carolina, the average person is going to see their uh, individual market health insurance rates more than double. And we saw this in Massachusetts with a much more highly regulated market than North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So in Massachusetts, uncompensated care was reduced by $200 million a year, but increased spending on insurance subsidies was $800 million a year. Mm -hmm. So there was a four to one ratio of savings from uncompensated care in the emergency room to increased spending. So, I mean, the, the numbers aren't adding up, essentially. And, and Mr. Astru, you, you made a, a very important point earlier um, with the exchange um, that you were having about, about choice um, and, that, and that really the American people should be able to have choice. And unfortunately, that's not what we're seeing, especially with the basic minimum standards or the essential health benefits that the mandate from the Affordable Care Act is, is Putting forward is that not true? Yes. No. Thank you. And I would even be more specific and say, you know, the the system right now tracks your location and wants to just give you information on that location. But you know, this is a complicated 
country with complicated families, it's very typical, for instance, mm -hmm. for one family member to be helping out another family member in another state or very something true. like that. So I would say not only should you be able to shop in your own state, mm -hmm. there's no reason in the world why you shouldn't be able, be able to, to stay in North Carolina or Texas or New Jersey you know, if you're helping a, a, a parent or another family member, what the policies are um, there because, you know, that's the way the country actually works in practice. Well, and I, I will just couple that by saying that, you know, I do believe um, that our insurance industry and the way that, that it has, that we have um, pursued that in this country has need re needed reforms. And that is why um, I, I am supporting the RSC plan of the American Health Care Reform Act because I do believe it, pr it will provide choice and cover many of the solutions that, that we've seen that would work for affordable health care in this country. So thank you all so much for your testimony today. And I truly appreciate it. But, you know, there again, we are going to all have to come together and work on this and fix this problem. And I don't know how this is going to, you know, pan out. I don't know t a timeline. But um, I do believe we can fix these issues. But it, it is going to need some, some significant work. So thank you. General H. Times expired. That concludes the uh, questions. I want to thank the um, witnesses for your excellent testimony, for answering all of our questions. Some members may have follow-up questions. Uh, we ask that you please respond uh, promptly. Uh, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and um, that will be um, by the close of business on Monday, December 2nd. Excellent testimony. Thank you very much. Very important, very informative. Uh, without objection, the subcommittee is now adjourned.